Pat Tompkins. She's the owner of this amazing orchard. Um, I've known Pat for what, about 15 years? Um, and we have been growers together and shared the trials and tribulations of growers. Um, and I know her to be always making the choice towards what is right as far as growing. Um, best practice, you know, how not to mess up the environment. She gets totally that it's about working with the environment. And I can testify as a regular customer of her fruit that it is one of, if you're here yesterday, Michael talked about how an apple a day doesn't really work anymore to keep the doctor away. You might need 30. If you're buying Pat's apples, you'll do just fine with one, maybe half. Because <laughs> um, they are dense and loaded with nutrition. They are not having an easy walk in the park. Um, and she, uh, I admire her in so many ways. Um, you're very fortunate that she's welcoming us here. And this is Michael Phillips, who I met on an elevator. At it was about as steep as this, too, yeah. that elevator. And I would not have gone to his talk if it wasn't for having met him, because I'm not—I wasn't into fruit really, but I just found him interesting. And I was sitting at his talk, trying to stay awake because I'd just eaten lunch and hadn't had enough sleep, and heard him say "acquired systemic immune response," and <laughs> snapped awake, and ran and got a cup of coffee, and said, "We need to bring him to Living Web Farms because Michael, in my experience, has a holistic approach to fertility systems and disease resistance." that applies way beyond fruit. That's like comprehensive and throwing. And I very much admire his work and, and really, really appreciate that he tolerated the hairy mo method in which I got him here today <laughs> with such grace. So. Now it's fun to be here. So I, I think the place to start is for you to introduce us to this incredible orchard and, and your life. Okay. <laughs> um. So I've been here 26 years. I came with my two sons and a husband at the time. Is the, is the microphone on? Um, and um, I've been here, uh, what we did was um, the cabin was here, the log cabin in the wormy chestnut barn that you saw when you came up the driveway. Um, we, the first thing we did was uh, clear for a garden and, um, and then uh, we're gathering materials to build the house, uh, 20 by 15 feet. I, I don't know if we went all these details, but um, uh, so it took some time to, to gather the materials and uh, build the house. And then moved in in December, we had been living in the log cabin while we were building the house. And, um, and then in March, my partner started clearing the three acres out here. And I had no idea what, what he had in mind. <laughs> but um, he, had, he had this vision for this orchard, uh, I think primarily because he was into making apple cider. And um, so he laid out, there's uh, 60 trees, 50 of them are apple trees. There are pear trees up there, and we started out with some peaches. They're all about gone now. They're all, they've all succumbed to brown rot. Um, although there is one peach tree that just kind of came out on its own from somebody spitting a seed. Mm -hmm. um, there's some cherry trees. Um, I guess that's about it. A persimmon. I mean, not a persimmon. Yes, a persimmon. Two persimmon. Um, there's some hardy kiwi over here. And uh, then we, we started planting the, um, at the same time dug the holes for 250 blueberry bushes, which are up above the grapes, up here behind the house. Um, that all happened between March and May, and it was, um, if I had known what he had had in mind, I don't think I would have been, a, been, a, been able to do it. But um, there it is, and as, as the years have gone by, and I've been here 18 years, um, learning a little more about permaculture and um, so I've learned about intercropping with a uh, different kind of insect um, attracting beneficial insects um, plants so that's been going on in between the trees as much as possible and um, and then up here behind the house there are trenches uh, that we use for human waste and building swales and and some kind of Hugo culture um, is in the plan for food forest. 
Um, so when you say 50 apples, let, let's, let's understand a little more of your varieties. And I'm, I'm kind of assuming these are all on seedling rootstock. They're, they're very big trees. Is that right? Standard. Uh -huh. did, did you or your husband at that time graft them? No. No. I really don't know anything about grafting. Where did you get your trees from? Um, some of the uh, major commercial growers, um, Stark Brothers and I um, can't even think of the other guy's name. Um, but, you know, so they're pretty basic trees. There are some heirloom trees up there too. Um, Grimes Golden and um, Baldwin. Is that, a, is that a Baldwin? One? Yeah. Um, uh, Arkansas Black. Um, but in some unknown varieties too that were misnamed, I think. Um, but they're all distinctive, um, 18 varieties. 18 varieties. And in, in that mix, do any really stand out as like year after year, they really give you your best looking fruit and others, which ones prove more problematic? Mm. Do you have a kind of well, sense of that? Problematic, the gala, the uh, royal gala has become um, scab infested. I can't mm -hmm. seem to get rid of it. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yep. Um, um, and then this Liberty here has been a really wonderful tree. Um, last year had some, had some cracking and scab, I believe. Um, so the dependable tree after last year's cold spring and a lot of rain, uh, a lot of, a lot of disease. Last came year was in. real mm -hmm. disease, right. Mm -hmm. So I'm also curious, like, so you planted the trees and trained branches, I think, because it looks like a lot of branches have yeah. quite the flat yes. spread. Um, do you do much pruning in the winter, spring, or do you mostly prune now? Mostly now. Mm -hmm to encourage the um, fruiting buds rather than the suckers. Um, so I'll be removing suckers and crossed branches at this time. Mm -hmm. And then but this is probably my most burning question. How long is your ladder? <laughs> <laughs> these are some tall trees. I well, I think it's a 10 foot ladder and mostly I get up there to climb. To, you uh, climb to, up, to, to okay. To climb to do the pruning and the harvesting. Yeah. Okay, well maybe we should go forth and start to find what we find. Okay. You know, one of the things that I think about when I'm shaping a tree, so a lot of times we shape a tree and we start it having a central leader and we train scaffolds to have strong branches, so this angle between the trunk and the branch ideally is 45 to 60 degrees. Now some varieties set and they do a more flat branch, but, but that'll be a very strong union. Whereas if you don't, I'm always doing this. So here I have trees and I don't even have to do this, but <laughs> if, if you don't train out a branch that's gonna be permanent, you'll get included bark. And then 10 years later, when this has a lot of fruit, that's gonna tear off the tree. And then depending on the height of the tree that you wanna work with, um, seedling rootstock has a lot of vigor and we're in a place where it's a long growing season in northern new hampshire this would be like year 50 till i could see a tree be this big just because it grows slower um, but keeping a tree to 20 24 feet is probably the right point for a seedling tree now they could get to be 40 45 feet tall so eventually I'm picturing you here with some kind of lift device so you can get up there. <laughs> I have had to top a lot of the trees, as you could see. Right, no, I, I, I've seen yeah. that. But one of the things you do in that context of, let's say it's a 20 foot tree. Now that, that doesn't mean it's, we're literalists and every year we're taking everything off so it's only 20 feet tall. It means sometimes some shoots go a little taller so they can have a lateral so you can make a nice cut. But one of the things I try to shoot for is the notion of sunlight and air penetration into the tree. And I'll just start with something a Vermont hill farmer told me. And that was, with a standard sized tree, 
when you're done pruning, if you've opened it up enough, and we'll get into why we want this sunlight, why we want this airflow, you should be able to pick up the family cow and throw her between the branches. <laughs> She'd get stuck. <laughs> now, when you, if you want to throw goats, which that, that's valid, um, very valid thing to do, you're, you're probably working with a semi-dwarf tree, like a 50, 60 percent vigor oh, tree. That's the size I've got. And then if, if, it's, if it's more of a 40 percent tree, it's a golden retriever. And, <laughs> and the, only, the only reason to grow the super dwarf trees is because you throw cats. <laughs> but, but that's a whole nother talk. Hey, Michael, can you suggest um, a decent limb spacer? I mean, a crotch angle spacer? They sell these little plastic things that fall apart within about three weeks, and they're really expensive. What do you use, or anything? I forget, the name. there's one out of Canada, out of Ontario. I think they use the words V-spreaders, the metal. And places like the Orchard Supply Houses, like um, Peach Ridge uh, in Michigan supplies offers those. But you'll find them in other places as well. Okay. But, but also, just taking lath board, the, the snow fence board, the, mm -hmm. and making V's in it, and you can make whatever length you need. Okay. So these branches were trained for sure, because I can just, there's a lot of flatness here. So part of this airflow thing has to do with scab, and what, do you know what variety this is, Pat? That's a Jonifrey. Then I won't find scab here, mm. because <laughs> <laughs> Jonifrey and Liberty are varieties that are bred with a mother tree that has something called the VF gene. And so apple scab, this is a fungal disease that overwinters usually on the leaves on the floor of the orchard. And in the spring, as the warmth accumulates enough, those spores mature. And when a rain comes, they come out by the tens of thousands. And I, I was curious to see what I was going to see here for scab because you don't have wild apples so much around you, but it, it got here because it can blow in from two miles away, maybe mm -hmm. even further. So oh, wow. even Pat, it found eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this particular mother tree, um, which grew at Purdue University, didn't get scab. And so they started crossbreeding to develop varieties. And through the 40s, 50s, into the 60s, these varieties first started coming out. And they were developed at Purdue, Rutgers, and Illinois University. So a lot of them have PRI in their name. I'm actually not sure where Jonifrey comes from, but Jonifrey is a Jonathan type with that gene. And when the spore of a scab lands on a leaf, it has to send out a hyphae to penetrate into the cell. And if it stays wet long enough, then that is what causes an infection because it accesses food resources in the, in the leaf. In this particular tree and in the Liberty tree behind me, that VF gene causes that particular cell that gets penetrated to have a hypersensitive reaction and die. So that one little cell on the surface of the leaf dies and scab no longer has the oomph to continue on to try to find another point to get into food resources. So we'll look at scab <laughs> in just a minute. But when I said that it has to stay wet long enough on the leaf, that typically is on the order of 8 to 12 hours. So it, it varies with temperature. So the, the cooler it is, the longer it has to stay wet. So there will be events in the spring, rain events in the spring, where the ground gets wet, there's a tenth of an inch of rain or more, and any spore at that point that's matured, any spore sac, will release its spores. And if, if the rain event is such that before 8, 10, 12 hours have passed, things have totally dried out, then the, that round of spores will be wasted. They're not going to take place. So, so there can be some years when it really works well. And this is why we're throwing cows between the branches, because we want breezes and light to penetrate in there. Now, another reason for a little bit more spacing between branches has to do with sunlight getting into the inner fruit, cell, uh, in, into the inner fruit buds. And if those fruit buds don't get at least 30% direct light, they're not going to be fruitful. And, and that's what you see as a tree gets bigger and bigger. You get the fruit out on the outer edge of the canopy, but it's no longer fruiting within. So one of the things we want to do 
once trees reach those bearing years, and particularly once we're 20 years plus down the road and we're getting a bigger and bigger tree, is open it up so we have young fruit buds, which when you have those water sprouts, you know, some of them are actually ideal. You're going to leave some of them so that they form new fruiting wood. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but ideally, no fruit bud is more than three feet away from direct sunshine. So let's look at that, what that means. There are apples here. <laughs> Further in, there's some, but at this point, this is about, here's direct sun, my hand's in the sun, and this apple is within that three feet. But on some of these trees, we're going to see a much denser canopy, and you're not going to see as many fruit down in there. And it isn't that that's wrong, it just means that you're now growing further and further out and maybe you want to keep it more closer to the trunk and and particularly if, if you're not going to go with an unlimited height not that this is unlimited because you did top some trees but but it's fairly up there um, i have to just tell my ladder story this is <laughs> i'm looking at these trees and i'm thinking pat how do you pick those apples but i know that you go up through the tree when i first was a picker in vermont I, it was a migrant hippie crew, and it was a lot of fun. This was in the early 80s, and we did pick some standard trees, and they gave us, they were probably 30 or 35 foot tall ladders. So an apple picking ladder has a point, so you can get it in between the branches. And, and this was picking a tree on a slope. I learned a lot in this particular moment. <laughs> and I was on the downhill side of the tree, and there was a branch hanging out with really no other branches below. And I could get the point of the ladder, maybe a foot of the point was into the crotch of the branch. That, that seemed okay. It was, had been rainy, the ground was very wet. I got on the ladder and went up there. And as you pick apples, you start to get heavier. You put them in your bucket. And without thinking about it, because I was, this was my first year picking, my ladder was sinking into the ground. Now the other thing that's happening is that the branch is getting lighter and lifting as I'm picking. <laughs> and so that foot rapidly became nothing. And then I was catapulted back into the sky and I probably fell like 15 feet. And I was young then, so I was okay. I could take it, I guess. <laughs> and then my ladder, my bucket of apples came landing on my chest. Boom, 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 boom. That's when I learned everything I needed to know about ladders. So you probably have a ladder story. I don't know if you do. <laughs> have you taken a spill in some of your trees? Yes, I have. I've taken... <laughs> Very embarrassing, oh, but it wasn't on a ladder, it was on a limb. <coughs> and you have the advantages of no witnesses here. <laughs> Which can be tricky. Anyway, so there's this goal of, of tiers within the tree so that air can get in there and dry things off. So when I say 8 to 10 to 12 hours, let's say it's, it's 8 in the morning, it starts raining. But by 10.30, the sun has come out and there's a good breeze blowing. Here, in your case, you may always have some airflow going down the mountain, but we're going to add a good breeze as well. And by 1 o'clock, this leaf feels totally dry. This is not the leaf that matters in this battle with scab. The leaf that matters <laughs> is deep down inside the tree. And you have to feel those leaves. And if there's still moisture, then scab still has a chance. So any spore that has landed on a leaf the leaf is wet during the rain when the spore lands, runs into the moisture puddle, which is often in the crevices. And it's in those deep crevices where scab can get a hold. We should actually, since we're talking about scab, find some scab. <laughs> Let's go find some scab. Like, what's that discoloration on the, on the apple there, like that? Is that just... I'm gonna get into the insects. Let me hold off on, okay. let me stick to a topic at a time. That also looks disease-free. The, <clears throat> the gala is down here, Michael, but that one has some... Well, th this is good. Yeah. <laughs> do you know, do you, what are these? I'd say this is Ozark Gold. Okay. Um, this is Cortland, and then the uh, gala is down there. Okay. Yeah. You typically have 
No, you have 18 varieties, so you have two or three yes, of yes, some trees. Yes, yes. So this is Ozark Grove, and on here, let's see on the leaf. Do I see it on the leaf? I don't see so much on the leaf, but, but this is scab. Um, you know, it, it just looks like a, a scab. That's why we call it scab. And this is a disease, it's a fungal disease that has a primary infection window, which pretty much goes from the moment the flower buds show color to about a week to two weeks after the petals fall off the blossoms. And I'm giving a range there because sometimes if at the end of bloom time, you don't have rain for 10 days, there's nothing to release the last spores. And so it's during that time, if we're trying to knock back scab, we have to understand when is it a real serious wedding event that we want, might want to do a little bit more. So I'll talk about how we might boost the immune function of the tree in that respect. But what scab does, this is a disease that now that it's here, it's going to go through a secondary cycle. And so these scab lesions, in turn, are going to produce conidia. And those conidia are also spores, but they're coming from the tree itself. And so when it rains in July and August into September, those conidia are washing anew onto the leaves and onto the fruit. And in a really wet summer, that scab can become what we call sheet scab and going from a few spots to, to literally seeming to cover the side of the fruit and even cracking and distorting the shape of the, sh of the fruit. So a spot or two or three, it's not like the end of the world, but as an orchardist, particularly trying to make a living, um, you want to put some energy into enhancing the tree's ability to handle that presence of disease during that primary infection window. Because if you, if you check it in the spring, then you don't have the same pressure coming at you throughout the summer months. You mentioned rain event. What, happened, what, what about dew? You get dew here, you know, that lasts until 11, 12 o'clock every day. You know, so you're talking about extremely wet. You know. Okay, so the dew... So all the leaves that fell last autumn and landed on the ground and that survived through the winter in the fall, they go through a reproductive stage, they form spore sacs, and those spore sacs are pointing up. And here, like in direct sunshine, that leaf probably matures fairly quickly, but the leaf on the backside in more of the shade, that's the spores that are gonna come after petal fall. So that's, that's why we have this range. Now, a good dew may not be enough to moisten that leaf surface to be releasing spores morning after morning. Because I, I know what I think you're talking about, but I'm talking about that leaf down there, which is, as the season grows and grass grows, it's not totally getting that moisture. So a tenth of an inch of rain will release, I believe it's 10%, maybe it's 25% of the spores that are mature. It takes a half inch of rain to release 90%. So, so in that window, there may be a leaf here or there that the dew is hitting. The thing that the dew is doing is if it started to rain, let's say at two yesterday afternoon, and it stayed wet into the night, the dew is just prolonging the wetting period on the leaf. So one of the reasons that if you're given a choice in where you can site your orchard, and you have an eastern facing slope and a western facing slope, um, you might want to choose the eastern facing slope if, if other variables were in your favor because the sunshine is going to dry things out a little bit quicker because that extension of the wetting period is just to the advantage of the fungal disease. Where am I going? So um, in terms of how do you help the tree during that primary infection window? Um, here at your orchard, I can't begin to imagine driving a tractor with a sprayer through here. Um, are you doing much with, with sprays? Nothing. Nothing, okay. Um, when they were young, when they were young, I was doing um, fish emulsion and seaweed. Okay. Um, and there's plantings of comfrey, comfrey under there and some Good. lemon balm and things like that, but. Okay. That's, that's my. 
So in this case, you are totally relying on, I'm going to say three things. And these are all in the category of what I call natural advantage. One would be that kind of more open pruning so things can dry out quicker. Um, another would be a real good fertility and a, a fungal soil ecosystem which is making the decisions about what minerals are brought to the tree because these leaves look very healthy um, for not spraying seaweed and, and some other things I'm going to talk about. Um, so there's definitely a, a good fertility cycle here. And the third big thing you can do to enhance natural advantage is you need to do everything you can so that those leaves that drop in the fall are not there in the spring. And so that's either going to be done through some kind of mechanical mowing that chops things up, the spreading of compost, which anchors things down, and more earthworms are going to chew that up. Uh, if you need lime uh, as a maintenance rate, because the soil's lost some calcium over the last few years of harvesting, uh, waiting until some of the a third of the leaves are down to do that spreading of lime because lime interferes with that reproductive cycle of the scab. Um, and my fourth method involves spraying because I'm adding, working with the fatty acids. Um, so that's, that's really all in the category of natural advantage. So a, as a home orchardist, small scale community orchardist, um, to that you can add the fact that you can add varieties, choose varieties that are less scab susceptible. So when you plant the Liberty or the Jonifrey, you get that VF gene. Now that's not a guarantee. And in fact, when you said maybe Liberty had some scab last year, um, I don't know if you're certain about that, but it turns out that these so-called scab immune varieties are starting to get scab in certain places. Now, I would not expect that here, but again, it can blow in from a distance. And the reason I don't expect it here is scab evolves, and this organism has figured out that mechanism in certain places. And usually the places where this evolution has taken place in scab, its ability to mutate to the change conditions, are in orchards where people are spraying some kind of fungicide, and let, we'll talk organic, so I'm talking sulfur and lime sulfur, but then they have scab immune trees, which they weren't spraying because there's no reason to put the energy or the material on there. You don't need it. But that's a great opportunity for an organism to have different kinds of things going on and shift some of its own genetics. So that's happened. And, and so these varieties, there's, there's no guarantee. But that's, that's how life is. There's no guarantee. Um, on the other hand, besides those scab immune varieties, there are also varieties that better tolerate scab. So in, in, in the modern category, this would include things like Honeycrisp, Sweet 16, which is also a Minnesota, Minnesota apple. Um, but then as well, there are what we call the heirlooms. So heirlooms go back 200, 150, 100 years ago. And it isn't so much that they're old and antique, it was just a time when people grew out seedling trees. And so when this, this apple if we I had a knife, I'd cut it open, I would find up to 10 seeds. And this is an Ozark gold apple. But those 10 seeds, Ozark gold is the mother. The pollen came from another tree. And so many fathers could be involved with this apple. Maybe it's all from the same tree. But even then, the pollen grain that made each seed has a different chromosome profile. So every seed in this apple, if you plant it out, and wait to grow a tree and six, seven, eight, ten years later you pick an apple, it's not an Ozark gold. It's something new. Just like each one of us is unique. We're not like our brothers and sisters. See now I need like, I'm just gonna like interrupt this camera. <laughs> I need like a director's prompt like why am I here and what am I doing and who are these people? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. I'm, I found the heirloom apple thing again. That's all right. I have to do that sometimes. <laughs> so back in the 1700s, 1800s, as people started to grow seedling trees, you know, you mentioned that one of your, your varieties is the Grimes Golden. Grimes Golden is very, very likely 
originally planted by Johnny Appleseed. So Johnny Appleseed was this guy who went and, and, and he was a good marketer and he knew that get seedling trees going because when people came and claimed land, they would want apples to plant because they couldn't trust the water and so he had to drink a lot of hard cider in those days. It was all about the hard cider. Anyway, Grimes Golden was one of the, the gems uh, that developed from this. Here's an apple that is actually the parent of Golden Delicious and all those varieties we see today like Jana Gold and um, Spy Gold and there's a number of varieties that, that are like that. But Grimes Golden is the parent and it has typically 17.7% sugar levels. So if, if you're a cider maker fermenting the juice, that means that you're getting a high alcohol out of that. So that's why Grimes Golden really took off. But another aspect of the heirlooms, besides the fact was, besides, is it a good keeper? Does it make great cider? Is it super for pies? Is it a dependable bearer that every year we knew we could get some dried apples from this tree? Was the fact that if a variety was subject to all kinds of diseases, um, people would say, that's just not worth growing. And so a lot of these heirlooms, part of the reason that they were chosen and given a name, like Aunt Rachel, and, it, and you get into the books of, of, of apple variety names, and there's quite a range of creativity in giving those names. Um, well, those that stood up to the disease pressures in a place regionally were the ones that got passed on that people wanted to graft and do more with. Um, today, we have more of a kind of a national, global approach to this in that nurseries, there's favorite commercial varieties. So you see the Gala and you see the Brayburn and the Fuji and the Golden Delicious and the Red Delicious. Um, we don't have as much selection. So part of orchard planning, particularly if you're not intending to spray, would be to give some thought to what can stand up to scab. What can stand up to an, a, another disease that's very likely to be at play in North Carolina is cedar apple rust, which has a relationship with the eastern red cedar. Now, I haven't seen that yet. I don't know if, if you're seeing that. Um, but you're also surrounded by mostly hardwood forest. And so the eastern red cedars are pretty far away because this is a disease that one year it's on the cedar. In the spring, you'll find these orange gelatinous sacs on the cedar tree. They're what's giving off the spores that land on the apple, and then it goes back and forth. But anyway, on an apple, you're going to see orange spots on the leaves and kind of a concentric, I'll even say orange ringed rot on the fruit. And if we see it, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Somebody brought a leaf, but I don't know where that somebody is. And okay. <laughs> But orange spots is, is, is an indicator of that. So that comes into the planning. But even more important to me, especially as we've come to understand a little bit more about the mycorrhizal fungi and all these health connections, is you need to grow apples you really love. And, and if it's a dud and you don't like that thick skin or, or this aspect of the apple, you don't want to grow it. And especially if you're trying to make a living at this. it's it's. You want to sell something you're excited about because that excitement goes to the people. So you might choose the scab resistant varieties, you know, the I scab. Um, one variety I grow is called Pristine. Pristine is a cross with Hawthorne, but it's an early apple that actually keeps good crunchiness and texture going into the, for on the order of four weeks. A lot of times uh, some of these classic heirloom summer apples like the Lodi or the Yellow Transparent or the Red Astrogan, uh, the Duchess, there's 24 hours. It's crisp and then it's soft and mushy. It's, 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 its moment goes by really quick. It has its moment, but it goes by really, really quick. Another apple in that category, William's Pride, um, which also is resistant to cedar apple rust. So with a little study, you can do it. Now on the flip side, there are varieties more prone than not to certain diseases. So when you say gala is an issue, well, gala is probably my most scab prone variety as well. And I haven't decided if I need to do even more or just have a little less gala yet. <laughs> I like the apple, but I don't like that aspect of it so much. Um, what I do is I've come to recognize that in nature, 
there's two additional factors that I can help supplement in order to make the tree and thus the leaves and the fruit less susceptible to disease. And those two things, one involves enhancing the immune response of the tree. So, so trees actually have, well, we could call it an immune system, but when this tree out here in the sunshine is going through the photosynthesis process and it's responding to the presence of disease or even some guy coming along and tearing off the random leaf or responding to an insect feeding on the leaf or on the fruit, it, through enzymes, triggers a phytochemical response and it produces certain compounds that help resist disease. These are basically isoflavonoids and terpenoids. And so when I talk in the holistic spray program about using something like neem oil, which is a oil pressed from the seed of a tree that grows in India and North Africa, Southeast Asia. It also grows in Florida and California. Definitely not indigenous to here, but so effective in, in many different ways. It's the terpenoids in neem oil, the spray, that stimulates the tree to thinking maybe it's even being attacked, but just to produce more of those compounds that help. When you sprayed seaweed once upon a time, kelp contains cytokinin hormone, and the cytokinins are something that trigger and synthesize flavonoids, and flavonoids are another one of those immune compounds in the tree. So when I talk about spraying during the prime infection window for apple scab, that's where I'm working. You know, conventional organics, it was always about spraying soft sulfur or spraying lime sulfur. And I'm not going to get so involved with that here because we're not doing that. But with a little bit of super heroic spraying here, Pat, <laughs> you could boost that immune function a little bit more. But, but I think mostly it's, it's about cleaning, removing some of those branches. Now, this is an interesting thing about branches and, and, a, and a human. So when you plant that young tree, and a young tree often will come as a whip. So whip means it has no side branches to begin with. And at the time of planting, you actually get to choose where you would like first branches to start. So what I want to talk about here is um, distinguishing between the two kinds of pruning cuts that we make in orcharding. One is when we come to a branch juncture and make that kind of cut. That's a thinning cut. That's going to readily callus over and, and not become, it's going to have an easy time healing. But when we come in and we cut right through the branch, and you know, this is a limb, it's, it's not such a great example, but if, if I cut right in the middle of that trunk, that's called a heading cut. So let's travel back in time with this tree 25 years ago, and it's a whip being planted. And that whip, I'm going to pretend, I don't know, it was four to five feet tall, possibly. I have one over there that's a whip. You do? Mm -hmm. Let's go it's to your whip. Coat. It's a rusty coat. It's always good to, to have the example. Does everyone know about the yellow jacket nest right there? I'm going to bounce you all around. Whatever topic comes up, we'll go where yellow it looks like it's nest. happening. Oh, yeah. I should put a stick. Is that the only one you know? <laughs> so far. We'll probably find a few more if I think. Yeah. When you show a thing, just be still for a second. Yeah. So zoom, okay. You started moving real quick. I said, whoa. <laughs> okay. I did that because I didn't like my example. <laughs> so, Michael, I should, I should take up from the ground about three feet. Are you well, saying we're going to go. Three feet? We'll you, go there. Let's, okay. let's start with the young okay. tree. Is it far? It's just up there. Um, about. 50 feet, but it's straight up. I mean, it's let's go. Terrain. Let's go up there. Terrain is a little bit. <laughs> Cleo, I've got more hair <laughs> in a bag. <laughs> you can have it. Beware of the drop off. Did you plant Jerusalem artichoke? Yes. <laughs> uh, never thin to me. They're so, except when I harvest them and then they just multiply. Okay, we'll go up here. Or around there. I 
a true whip, mostly. <laughs> Did you plant this? Well, I'll wait for them. This year? I'll repeat that. So this is a tree you planted this year? Mm -hmm. so you got it from a nursery or did you graft it? Well, she got it from a nursery. Okay. Okay, so as we get into this tree shape thing, one of the cool things you do in orcharding when you, you're pruning is, and you can't really do this any other aspect of human experience, but you can time travel and we can go back into the past and we can go seven, 25 years into the future because there are things that are gonna happen in response to our pruning cuts. And, and it isn't like you can do a snip here and know that 25 years later, it's gonna look like that. But, but there's a way to, to kind of understand that. And, and as you get into pruning, um, it all begins with the whip you really need to be envisioning what am I, why am I doing this? Because what's the response of the tree going to be? So we just introduced the idea of a thinning cut and a heading cut. And there is a different response by the tree. So a heading cut where you go right through the stem is far more invigorating. So there's going to be more of a vegetative response to a heading cut. Now this is a baby apple tree that was grafted. Um, and the graft is right in this zone here. And this is the bud that was developed out in the nursery for one year. And we have to just step back to six months ago. And these side lateral shoots were not here yet. So what was here was the tip of this tree, which I don't know if you, did you tip it or did she, or did that just winter kill? It, it regardless, it doesn't matter. Let's pretend there's no side branches here. Time travel with me back six months ago. So this tree, maybe it was this tall. Someone made a cut here. Maybe it was winter kill, I don't know. But that cut here removed the tip bud of the shoot that was here. And that in turn has induced the buds immediately below to do a certain response. So by removing the tip bud, Let's look at this shoot as a single entity. This shoot is going towards the sky and the sunlight. And in doing so, it is producing a hormone called auxin. And that auxin inhibits the growth of buds popping out in the immediate vicinity of the bud going up. So that gives this shoot what's called apical dominance. Now we'll go back into the spring. <laughs> when that bud is removed, there's no longer a source of the oxen hormone and so the buds immediately below and sometimes it'll be two as we see in this case um, or even three we could call this part of that response sometimes it'll be as many as five all go vertical and that in turn means that there's two three four five times as much oxen which that flood of oxen further down the trunk causes other shoots to shoot out more laterally it's it's just the basically kind of an os osmotic pro pressure of oxen hormone on the top side of the bud, causing it to shoot out more laterally. This cut here, which is a heading cut on a whip, typically you can plan on eight to 10 inches below there where the first buds are gonna shoot out laterally. So when you plant a whip, you have in mind an idea that first branches on your tree are going to be maybe three feet off the ground. You know, if you're planting a dwarf tree, it gets much more compact. But with a full-size tree that you're not looking to graze animals under, three feet off the ground is not a bad height. 25, 30 years down the road, 
Maybe you're gonna remove those so you have more of a spreading canopy because branches will reach down with the weight of fruit. But you are choosing where you want branches. Now, if you have a six foot high whip and in your mind you have this brilliant idea that you can graze goats underneath your tree or cows or sheep, <laughs> or, or it's a place where you're not going to be able to protect from deer forever, um, you might choose to make that cut at five feet so that first branches start at like four feet plus. And just left to its own devices, if no one made this cut, sometimes a whip will grow up really tall and only have first branches at four or five feet. So it, it's kind of nice to be able to have a little bit of a say and this is my goal. So I don't like to start branches a lot lower than that because they're down where I'm gonna be mowing the grass. But as well, now we go back to what we were talking about with scab, it stays wetter down low longer. The morning dew, that factor, is more relevant down low than it is up high in the tree. And so three feet with that proper crotch angle means you have branches coming out at four or five feet and the weight of the fruit holds them right down there at a really nice picking height. So that typically is, is where we wanna to shoot to have it. So you make a cut, typically with a full-size tree, it'll be at like about 42 inches. Some people will drop it to 36 inches. That means eight to 10 inches below, buds will pop out laterally. That response of a few buds going vertical needs to be in place for basically till the end of June, till they get to be about three, four inches long. So this shoot here has grown as much as seven or so inches this season already. Um, but letting them get to be about four inches long, so it has that ec effect of excess oxen to pop buds at the right height, and then to come in and to make a choice to let one of these be the leader. That means the end of June or so, I'm gonna to wanna to remove the other vertical growth at the top. And, and this one, is kind of vertical, but they're also very supple right now. So in this case, in looking at this tree, you know, there's some leaves here. I'm not going to remove these leaves, but they're also not shooting out, but they're part of growing a root system on this tree. So extra leaves in that first year or two or three, if they're not interfering with anything, is good. If there were shoots coming out here, I would also remove them down low. But by removing this shoot, Rather than getting two shoots that grow to be maybe 10 to 12 inches, I'm gonna have one shoot where all the energy goes into it and probably gets to be 18 to 24 inches. So I'm, I'm developing more tree structure by making that choice. This one that's a little vertical right now, uh, if I had a clothespin, I could fasten, you don't happen to have a clothespin, do you? Go get the clothespin and we'll I'm treating this too much as if I'm being filmed. I'm sorry. This is a good time to ask a random question. I'm when you get a whip um, that has a good rootstock and you put um, a graft on that, um, does the graft maintain the genetics of the graft or does it mix genetics with the whip and the graft? So this was a, a whip and tongue union and that complete shearing of the wood the cambium cells of the inner bark have calloused over and so this new wood with buds now growing and becoming this young tree everything from this point up is the variety that's been grafted there's no intermingling of genetics and if a bear came and, and snapped this tree off down here like this shoot here um, this is off the rootstock if this was to have an apple, it would not be the same as the apple from here because that's the boundary marker. This is a new variety. Perfect. So with this shoot here, and this is a good time to do it, um, coming in with a, just a regular old clothespin, putting the clothespin end onto the shoot, the main stem, and tucking the shoot in between the, the legs of the clothespin, I've now changed the angle of that shoot. And the way that this works is we all know if we cut a tree down, we can count the growth rings and know that it's 60 years old or, or what have you. Well, every year, the cambium cells, the inner green bark, divide. And the outer part of the cambium 
is next year's cambium, and the inner part becomes wood. It's, it takes on the carbon aspect of wood. So right now things are supple and growing, but about mid-August, the tip buds of all these shoots will set and it'll start to harden off going back down through the trunk, which is important for surviving the winter and the cold months to come. But that hardening off process, when that inner ring of cambium becomes, that growth ring for that year becomes wood, means that in October, November, this clothespin is removed this does not snap back up to where it was. Where now, it's gonna kind of come back up to where it was and, and tend to go more vertical. But this is an easy way to, to shape a tree. And in these early years, the, the whole idea of shaping the tree to form proper crotch angles that are gonna be able to hold a good crop, um, that's really where you wanna put your effort, not into a whole lot of pruning. On the whip, I did this pinching off because I had two verticals. I want the energy to go into one. So now I have one, two, three, and eventually I can wiggle that down a little more and I'll get it out a little bit more. Having anywhere from three to five scaffolds is the goal on this tree. And I'm going to develop them over the course of time and we can go look at branches and see this better on some mature trees, but I'm gonna develop them so they each branch out and they each represent a quadrant, whether you can't use the word quadrant with three, but with four you could. And that's my goal, that I want to create a few branches. Now, one of the things that sometimes happens for people, two things with a young tree. One, they don't remove those double verticals or those triple verticals. And then they have a tree with almost everything going straight up. So that's weak bark, it's likely to break off. But what also happens is, right now that was not that painful for anybody here, was it? That I snipped off that one little shoot. <laughs> Maybe one or two of you felt that was a bit, a bit extreme. But what happens is if you let this grow for next year and next year and next year, you become attached to both sides. Not that only that, but because they're crowded in between each other, they don't develop laterals going that way. So six years down the road, now we're really time traveling, um, it becomes painful to make that cut, even though you've now come to a class and you've learned that, oh, that's what I should have done. So you have to avoid the attachments. You have to understand that, oh, it's so much easier to do now because I see how it's going to grow. I know that that will be a problem eventually. But once there's that five, six years down the road, it's like, that was the branch that my, my boy played on. He swung on that branch and, and then you can't touch it. And then you get these lopsided trees and, and, and lots of problems. So let's go back to, uh, we passed a tree that was maybe your next stage of growth. Maybe it's 10 or 15, 12 years old. It was right by the house. Mm -hmm. Let's go to that tree. Michael, will you head off that leader again next year? Okay. Same way? Edit that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my goal in seeing this grow to be about this much this summer, um, and it might pop some more laterals up here. But that might be next year. But if this tree is this tall for the girth that it has, I don't consider that a problem. Now, if there was a lot of nitrogen here, and let's say this grew like six feet, <laughs> and it was lanky and whippy, then I would probably head it again, keeping in mind I'm gonna have that vertical response, we call that the crow's foot response, and I'm gonna make it in such a place that I have laterals here, some space in between. This is where I really want some more laterals. That will stiffen up the trunk in terms of allowing it to grow more girth. So I won't do it automatically because to head this shoot again means I'm putting more energy into vegetative growth, which in year two, three, and if you're patient, it just means you're waiting another year or two for fruit. But if it, if it doesn't outpace itself, um, this is a tree that by year six, seven, I'd expect to see fruit because I suspect it's probably a big tree, a, a seedling rootstock. Um, and that, that gets compressed for semi-dwarf and dwarf trees. But if I don't have to take off that leader, I'm gonna get to fruiting sooner. Now at the same hand, hand I'm not gonna, if there's a flower on this in year three or four, I'm not gonna get greedy and say, I gotta have that apple now, because the tree's not maybe big enough for that weight. The first four or five 
years are about growing wood structure that can hold a crop. And if you crop it too soon, and again, this ties to the rootstock, the vigor of the tree. If you crop it too soon, you can stunt the tree and literally stunt it for its life, that it, it's overcommitted and now you don't get the growth. How far between the scaffolding you know, branches would you want? So that question involves what's your vision of a height that you want to work with? So with a seedling vigor to say, I'm going to keep everything to 12, 14 feet, you're really going to fight it and, and you're basically going to be doing the water sprout crew cut thing where you have lots of water sprouts, you drop them down to that height and the tree responds with lots of water sprouts. You don't grow a lot of fruit when you do this crew cut method of pruning. Um, but let's say we're, we're planting on a tree that's going to be 18, 20 feet tall, which, which is a fairly good sized tree. Um, eventually, I am going to want to have scaffolds here with branches reaching out like this. And here's the space where the, the cow's going through, <laughs> branches growing here. But in forming this tree, in the early first 10, 12, even 15 years, I probably will develop some scaffolds in here to fruit and to have leaves to help grow wood structure. And I won't make those cuts right away. But eventually I'm going to reach a point where I can see that my bearing canopy is going further and further out and the branches and I'm going to be able to show you that better on an existing tree. So let's go to the next step, 10 years down the road. Hey Michael, if you, if you were to cut out the, tree, the branches that kept the cow from being thrown through this, you'd get probably better fruit set because of more sun coming into the places that are left. Is that true? You would get more internal fruit buds fruiting. What is this tree, Pat? This is Tompkins Tompkins King, King, County uh -huh. King. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. So is this tree maybe like 12 years old, 10, 12 years old? Well, That's what it... Let's see. Uh, actually, it's a little bit more than that. Um, it was in another location. Okay. Up there, and I brought it down here. It was planted in where another tree had been. And of course, it didn't... It wasn't thriving. Yeah. So it's really good. So it's okay, so in this tree, we kind of have a an oddball growing further down low, which is totally fine. It's, it's not interfering with anything, but in a sense, if we picture this as a whip and we had trained for this, <laughs> at about four feet high, we have four scaffold branches in place. And that would have meant that the whip, the heading cut on that whip would have been made at about five feet tall to, to induce this response. Now, these branches all have a good crotch angle, um, what they don't necessarily have is all the space that they need to fully develop as they could. So by that, I mean there's this branch and there's this branch. Mm -hmm. And then there's this branch with this Y in it. And so this branch is shading this branch, which prevents it from really becoming all that it could be in terms of lateral spreading out and filling its own quadrant. And it also, if you think about airflow, this branch <laughs> is really changing the dynamics of how this might dry out. So I think of this in terms of light space. And when I look at two branches, you know, in the pruning books, you'll, you read about remove all branches that cross and everything that's really vertical, okay? So that's actually something that is mostly useful information, but you do not want to be rigid about it. Um, in terms of, start to look at your tree more in terms of light space. Does the branch I'm keeping have all the light it needs to really spread out and become fruitful in, in all directions? So the bigger cuts I like to make in late winter, early spring. So for me, that is, is basically the month of March into April when I'm doing a lot of my pruning. But I'm also dealing with three feet of snow on the ground, and so I don't like to crunch through the snow and, and start pruning in February. And another relevant thing for the north is if it drops below zero degrees um, within a week after you did a pruning cut, that bigger pruning wound is less likely to callus over as well. So that's another reason we wait. So for you, the dormant pruning window is probably more like 
end of February, March, where for me it's March, early April. I'm just further north. Summer pruning is something that is done the very end of July, mid-July, end of July, into the first week of August. But it's not something you go into the end of August with because that whole business of the terminal bud setting on every shoot and hardiness developing back down through the trunk to the soil line, um, pruning late in August is going to interfere with that. And that's going to set your trees up for winter injury because you don't know how the cold is going to come on that fall, how deep the cold is going to be that winter. So on this tree, training's nice. This branch and this branch really are doing the same thing at this point. This branch is interfering it. This, this is a really obvious pruning cut to me. Um, and there's only one way that I, I wouldn't change that choice. This branch is kind of heading off in this direction. That's the side of the tree that these three branches don't cover. And it's coming up, and that could be one way of doing it. Another thing that could be done, Would if you, you didn't have this branch, say, is that this branch could be tied to a stake or a block. And in the course of a year or two, the rings are going to harden, and you now have a branch on this side of the tree. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways to work a tree where you can get it to be what you want it to be. But this, this branch has is coming up enough and is going to spread out into this space that I feel it represents part of that, that quadrant. Michael, would you like to have some pruning tools right now to, to demonstrate? Or I have them right in the house. Oh, there's a couple cuts we could make, um, but I, I don't know that I need to so okay. much, Pat. Okay. So here's a great example of vertical, obviously vertical, right? If you read other books, it would be, this guy has to go. I don't feel that. <laughs> what I feel is that this guy needs to be spread out mm -hmm. here so this branch has something coming out into this part of the space. Mm -hmm. Now, one of these might do it as well, but this is just bigger. So with some type of training stick stuck in here in the early spring, early part of summer, I could do that. The other thing is sometimes just bending water sprouts breaks the cells in here enough that they'll start to have fruit. So one of the things about verticals, now this is an example where I wouldn't be doing that because to bend this would be to put it into this branch's space. You know, I'd have be creating crossing branches. Now if I thought this was a really old branch, was a branch that didn't have a lot of vigor and I wanted to replace it, um, actually just bending this sprout under there that's training it and letting that grow for a year and then removing this branch now establishes young wood. So let's talk about young wood. Um, apples and pears give their fruit on tiny spurs. Some varieties do it, set the, have fruit at the terminal end of the shoot, but most apples and pears are going to come off tiny spurs. And those spurs can be fruitful for 20, 30 plus years, but it's only between year three, year 10, year 12, that those spurs are gonna produce their most vigorous fruit. And as they get to be older spur wood, they are going to grow smaller and smaller apples, which kind of corresponds to a tree getting more dense and dense if no one's pruning it and opening it up. So one of our goals in working with an apple tree is continually renewing the fruiting canopy, getting young wood off our old wood, you know, our trunk and our chosen branches, they're there for the duration, unless something happens or the bear breaks it off. Um, but off of there, we want young wood. So let's, let's do a little time traveling with this shoot. If we bent this, right now this is totally I'm going to say it's all one year old wood, that this all grew this year already, which is, is quite a bit of growth but I don't see the division between two-year-old wood and one-year-old wood on this. So if I train this sprout to come over here into this light space, um, next year, because I've flattened it, it's gonna be even better at growing laterals rather than just focusing on growing up. If I let it grow up, it would develop some laterals, but it's gonna definitely develop some side branching. And by year three, 
it's going to firm fruit buds. Apple wood does not have a fruit bud on one-year-old wood or two-year-old wood. On two-year-old wood, it might form a fruit bud. But by year three, it's going to form a fruit bud. So this, this branch is coming out. It's becoming longer. There's laterals. Now there's some fruit on it. And we've trained it with a little angle up. But as it starts to have its first fruit, there's a little bit of weight on it. That's like training. So now the branch is coming down a little bit more. And over the course of the next eight, ten years, as we keep picking fruit and we're coming further out, but we're still picking inside because we have an open enough tree to get sunlight in there, um, what's going to happen is a new shoot's going to arise over this as this comes down. And about year 10 or 11, that thinning cut from that new shoot gives us the new wood in this zone of light. You can kind of like see that progression, how that happens. And, and we maybe can show that a little better on an actual fruiting tree. So between these branches here and these branches here, these guys, maybe this is the one you want to train here, but these guys are kind of extra. Can, can you see that? That this is crowding, this guy's kind of taking the light space of this one and also that air space. So these are also pruning cuts that I would make next year. Um, I'm not going to necessarily get into removing all the little wood, but at this point, I want more airspace here where the cow, the golden retriever goes. Um, and that means there's going to be more sunlight in here, which means there's going to be fruit in the inner canopy. It's not going to just be going further and further out. These, on the other hand, are branches that have grown them for three, four, five, six years before they're seriously starting to interfere with the branch below it. Um, that just means more leaves, which is photosynthesis, for growing wood and growing a strong tree. If I want a forced growth of spurs um, on that branch that's totally lanky with no leaves on it, the second one up there, like right, right, no, below that, below that. This. Now, Let's say, and I'm not using this tree as an example, that, but I have a branch like that at home that I'd really like to get some more spurs on. Is that a, a time when I'd make a cut out at the end to force? Very good. Oh, good. That kind of heading cut is going to induce buds to pop out laterally. This is actually, let's, let's go back, time travel backwards with this one. <laughs> um, because this branch kind of crowded on here, I see pruning cuts were made here and here. So if this had been the main branch, there would have been room for this, but it's been removed. Um, and not that Pat has an attachment to this, I have no idea. <laughs> but again, that's the cut, because this is the branch to develop. Um, and then we have some more airflow. So that's the kind of thing that's so much easier to do when the tree is small, as you visualize it. You, you allow some extra growth at first, until it crowds the light space of the branches you're keeping, then you remove it. So I'd like to go now to a bigger tree, and we'll look at maybe what I might do with that. Okay, <laughs> I didn't take my eyes up there, but yes, this would be removed, I think, because this is too sharp. And even though this is going out that way, we have this branch and this branch shooting out there. You know, here's, here's that, I didn't even notice this. <laughs> Example of a training, pulling a branch over or pulling it down from the vertical. But yeah, that would be the, uh, that's probably the fourth cut I'd be making on this tree. Is there any reason why using the spacers is better than strings or can you do either way? Well, these you might trip over or when you're sawing, they're in your way. I mean, sometimes you need to do something like this. Mm -hmm. um, but with the really little tree and the subtle tree, like this would actually be hard to tie down. It's really supple. Um, so a spacer is going to work better. A limb spreader is what we call them. I'm going to go into this tree. And, and people can kind of see best from that angle. You have groundhogs here, Pat. Oh, well, the, I think that's a dog after some bowls. Okay. <laughs> it, it, 
boy, and it looks like some damage might have been done to the roots. Yeah, they're getting down there. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a tree where first branches dog. are at about two feet off the ground. And if, if you look out there and just follow like the branch right there, um, it's a foot and a half off the ground. It's very lateral. And so everything that's below four feet is what I call in, in the fungal zone. Mm -hmm. It's less likely to dry out after a rain. You're not going to get as much production. And particularly if you're growing comfrey and, and some of these different plants we'll talk about in a little bit underneath the tree in, in creating your orchard ecosystem. Um, so this is a little lower than I like to go. On the other hand, this is Pat's tree. And, and it's not wrong. It's just a little lower than I would go if I was training from the very beginning. I, I would have branches more at this height or, or even this height. So that's one choice of decision. So depending on the scale of our orchard, uh, another reason we might do this is how are we mowing? How are we getting underneath the tree with a sigh? Well, then maybe that's not a, as much of an issue. Or on the other hand, are we going down the aisle with a tractor and a sickle bar and trying to get along underneath the tree because we have two acres of orchard or 10 acres of orchard? These would probably not be kept just for that reason alone, on top of which they're more in the fungal zone. So we could say we were making that choice and getting rid of the lower branches. Um, but let's say we're keeping the lower branches because that's how I visualize describing this. So now, ignoring that talk about mowing in the fungal zone, this branch here is, is very much on top of that and very close to this. In fact, all of these, and so this is a mature tree um, 25, 30 years down the road. Removing this scaffold layer, it seems radical, means two things. There's gonna be more sunlight getting down to these lower branches, which right now these lower branches are basically blind. You know, there's no young wood coming off of it. There's no buds, there's no fruit. So fruit happens out there but it's not really happening in here. So that would change that dynamic and there'd be shoots coming up that would become fruitful down here in this zone, which is a lot easier to pick. Um, and that creates more light openings. But in some ways you have to just really hold true to that notion that any fruit bud's gonna be within three feet of the sun. You know, and right now, here may be as direct sun at one point of the day, but this is pretty much solid canopy all the way down through here, and it's not fruitful. And not that that's wrong, it just means that you're gonna grow a tree that gets fruiting further and further out. Then we have those, the tops. And those cuts would be made in the winter? I would those make big cuts. bigger cuts yeah. then. So one of the reasons, one of the advantages of pruning water sprouts now, the late, the late July, early August window, is that they're not so big that the tree is not going to callus them over, or a big cut that's going to take more oomph and time to callus over, and then you're going to prevent the hardening off factor. Um, another reason is that you would just open up the airflow, so you're going to get better coloring of the fruit. Uh, and the other is that, and particularly when you're working with a big overgrown tree, and you made some big cuts in the dormant season window, often those big cuts, there's gonna be a water sprout response both around the cut and where sunshine is now on the branch. That water sprout response, if you let it go to next spring and remove them, you pretty much get the same vigorous response back, more water sprouts. But if you cut those now, there's a lot less of a vegetative response in the spring. So again, the, the, the need to summer prune Depends on the vigor. Is there a lot of water sprouts crowding the interior of the tree if it's fruitful? Because mm -hmm. it isn't so much that water sprouts are out here. They're, they're usually off of the branches inside the tree. Um, in restoring a big tree, you can get it back into fruitful condition sooner by getting out of that vegetative mode. But the other thing is, um, and now we get back to that rule of thumb about remove everything that's vertical. When you remove everything, the tree wants to fill that space again. So you have to learn to leave 
10 to 15 percent of the weaker water sprouts mm -hmm. to be in that space so the tree doesn't respond with full vigor. And mm -hmm. by letting those water mm -hmm. sprouts grow for a year or two, they develop laterals, which are going to be mm -hmm. fruitful in the mm -hmm. top of the tree. Now you cut, make a thinning cut on that water sprout, right where the branch juncture is with those lateral you want to keep, and that's a lot less vegetative as well. So these kinds of things go into talking, and when orchardists talk about keeping a tree calm, I mean, you want growth, but you don't want wild growth, and you don't want stunted growth, but you want <coughs> calm growth so that the tree mostly focuses on being fruitful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got a question here, Michael. Yes, good. Are you okay with answering a pear question now, just because of the way those darn branches, I'm talking about Asian pears mostly, but the darn branches just grow straight up. They're not water sprouts, nope. but it's just their form. And is, is that just a fact of life, or do we keep these same principles in mind for pears? You, you adjust the principles because the, the nature of most pears, and there's some apples like this, is to really go vertical. On the other hand, you do train branches, and you try to create get away from that totally umbrella, inverted umbrella thing that pears like to do. Then there are also some varieties that tend to not only have that vertical kind of inclination, but they're also slow to come into fruit. So Northern Spy is a great example of this. Northern Spy, typically it, it is until year 10 or 12 that you'll have fruit buds. So in the growing, you trained the branch with a good crotch angle young, but then it, it kind of grew back up. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. had it had fruit in year five or six mm -hmm. to weigh it down, it would have done the thing perfectly. But because it did that, sometimes those type of varieties and pears are in this group. This, uh, we're talking about training big trees right now. Um, I, I'll train them again. I have a good crotch angle, but I'll tie it down again like this, which is also gonna help bring it to fruit sooner because when a, a vertical shoot um, tends to be more vegetative, but when you bring it down, it tends to understand it's now time to go into the fruiting mode. Okay. Can I ask you about big cuts? Yeah. Because I always feel worried about big cuts, you know, if you didn't make it soon enough and you've got a really big cut about disease getting in there. Um, and so if this were your tree, would you take those, all those bottom at this point in the life of this tree, let's say you just bought the property, would you take those, those lower branches all off in a late winter, early spring? I'm either going to remove the middle between ones, or I'm going to change my plan, as you just said. And let's say I've decided they're just too low. I mean, this is that lower branch. This is not too low out here. But in terms of making that cut, it's about, and we probably could find such a callus on your trees, but if I wanted to make, remove this branch, mm -hmm. um, there's a branch collar here, which is a little more obvious than it sometimes is, where the branch, this is swelling out. Well, if, if I cut this branch off here and left this stub, mm -hmm. this stub would very likely die, and it would be colonized by black rot, and that would be an issue. Right. Now this is all about making the cut in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. If I made that cut through the branch collar, the, where it swells off the trunk, that also would not necessarily callus over nicely, and brown rot, black rot, excuse me, black rot is the one I'm talking about, mm -hmm. might get into the trunk. But if I make that cut right outside the branch collar, it's gonna callus over and just be a bump on the tree. You'll see that for 10, 15, 20 years, but eventually the girth of the trunk will even absorb it and you won't see it anymore. So it's all that, your question is all about making a cut in the right place. Uh -huh. so if you wanted to do a wall, would you do like half of them the first year and then half the next year? Hi. <laughs> if you were, okay, so if you if wanted to get away so that you could mow underneath this tree. So one rule of thumb in bringing back in more of a, an un, unmanaged tree um, but it applies to this situation, it's managed, the branches are trained, is to not remove more than 25-30% of the leaf canopy in a given year. So in this case, if, if my focus was on either removing one of the, the intermediary scaffold or 
deciding to take out the lower branches, that's definitely within that. I could do all those cuts in one year. Now, if this was an unmanaged tree without this branch shaping and nice branch crotches and reaching out in different directions, um, and there was a lot more vertical cuts or there were water sprouts that were allowed to, to grow for 20 years and formed like a whole new top on the tree, I'd be looking for three or four big cuts I could make that start to drop the tree to a more manageable height and also open up airflow in between. And, and part of what I want to do there is also induce some water spouts, which I'm going to leave the weaker ones, which are going to become young fruiting wood in the zone that I've opened up to the light. So in the case of restoring an overgrown tree, that might be a three-year process because of you don't want to overdo it. Then one other last thing to think about. Now, that you only have a 10-foot ladder still amazes me. <laughs> These are big. <laughs> um, is I have a 14-foot and an 18-foot pointed ladder, which I can get into the crotches of my trees. And my trees are typically, I'm going to say I keep them to 16 feet tall, but sometimes they get a little bit taller because I give them a couple years to develop those laterals, and then I bring them back down. Um, I'm always thinking about where's my avenue to get in with the ladder to the heart of the tree, to, to lean my ladder against the trunk so I can get up into the center. So that's another thing that comes into play. It's like, how are you getting into your tree? This is if you're working with bigger trees. If... Would be like a standard size you're talking about? Well, this whole business of, of rootstock ties to the vigor that comes out of that root. So these are what are called seedling or standard rootstocks. Mm -hmm. So they have the vigor to grow a tree that's 35, 40 feet tall. And that's going to get a lot more difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm doing something in between, um, what I call a semi-standard root. So these are things like MM111 mm -hmm. and BUD118. Now those numbers don't mean anything about the size. It's just at a research station which in the case of the bud is Budagovsky in Russia, and in the case of MM is the Maling Merton Research Station in England. So that part carries on with the rootstock name. Um, those are trees that are 75, 80, 85 percent vigor. So that's mostly what I grow when I talk about a tree that I'm letting be like 16 feet tall. So a seedling tree, typically 20 feet, is a reasonable kind of compromise between its ability to go much further and its, its desire to grow enough. If you try to keep that vigor really tame to like 12, 14 feet, you're mostly fighting it. So part of your choosing in designing your orchard, and this is whether it's the home garden kind of orchard or it's a small commercial or a large commercial operation is what size trees do I want to work with? And so now we'll, we'll drop down again. Uh, the next size is more like M7 and M106. So now I'm talking like 60% vigor, 65% vigor. These are all trees, everything I've mentioned so far, that can be freestanding and that has a large enough root system to anchor that tree well, even when it holds a crop. When we start to drop below that size, um, things like G30, which is 45-50% vigor. The, the G series is something that was bred at the Geneva Research Station in New York. And these are all rootstocks that have great resistance to fire blight. They, they grew out 10,000 seedlings. I'll explain that word in a minute <laughs> in a new way. Uh, and deliberately gave everything fire blight. And they only worked with the survivors. So earlier we talked about how every seed produces a new apple. This is why we graft. If, if we want another Ozark gold or another Liberty, we have to graft it, just like on that whip, to have that variety again. We can't get it from seed. Similarly, over the course of time, when a seedling grows, they're not all big, huge, vigorous trees. Sometimes there's a smaller tree in that mix. And so when I talk about a rootstock like M7, which is the Malling Research Station, one that they did work with in the early 1900s. Um, that's actually a tree that's about four, a rootstock that's about 400 years old that was first grown in French monasteries. 
because mm -hmm. they noticed it only had like half the vigor. The 7 or the 106? The M7. And, um, and I forget the French name. That, that It had a varietal name, but it was more of a dwarfing rootstock that could espalier it against the wall. It wasn't overwhelming. Um, all those stunted seedlings, and they can be stunted on the order of tomato plant size to like 50%. 75% vigor, there's, there's a range there. Mm -hmm. um, from that point on, they also can't be reproduced by seed. They have to reprodu be reproduced clonally. So often that involves taking that whip, letting shoots start to grow, and then burying it, m mounding up wet soil dust around it so that the shoots at their base develop roots, and those can be snapped off. And that's what all the dwarf rootstock amounts right. to. That's one of the ways of, of propagating rootstock. Um, but at the 50% size class, we go from trees that can be freestanding to trees that require some kind of support to even far more radical understory management in terms of keeping the ground clear underneath. So if, if we choose to grow like an M9 rootstock or Bud9, um, which are more like 30%, 25, 30% vigor, that range, those are trees that either need to be on a trellis or they need a stake. And they can be trained as a freestanding shape, um, but typically they're, they're more grown on a trellis as like a pole. And, and you just do a lot of pinching and training to keep them very productive. And that's where we get the, the fruiting wall that Extension often recommends commercial growers go with because it's very productive. But it's also, to be economic, highly chemical dependent especially if you're doing it on a significant scale. So those are trees that don't have a large root system, and so they don't want a lot of competition plants around them. So herbicide, that's pretty economical. It's not, not very healthy, but it's pretty economical yeah. in terms of how you can apply herbicide to keep that open. Organic growers, um, it's either going to be about shallow cultivation or mulching those trees to keep them more open. And um, if you really want to work with a tree that's 8 to 10 feet tall, you can choose that M9 size tree. But what I like to do is, is get people to think about growing the 40% vigor size tree. These are trees that have enough of a root system that they can take some other plants in the vicinity. Uh, they still need a stake, and in some cases it's because of a brittle graft union and they'll snap, snap off under a crop load. In some cases it's, it's just they don't have the anchorage to hold a crop up if when they become fruitful. Mm -hmm. So the stake's also useful in those early years just to train the tree. Even with a standard seedling tree, um, and, and actually I'm, I'm, this is a curious question because you have quite a slope. I used to think I had a slope, but now I know what a slope is. <laughs> um, where's South Pat? This way. Okay. So my trees, and this tree kind of shows this, have a real tendency to lean towards the sun. And, and maybe here you don't have it as much as I do at 45 degrees latitude. <laughs> but I have to work a lot to train branches on the north side of the tree, and I have to really favor leaders that are going back towards the north, because otherwise the whole tree starts leaning mm -hmm. out over the lower branches. But you don't seem to have had that issue. Maybe you did earlier on and you just your choice of branches led to but other than this one I don't I don't really see that tendency to be bowing towards the south. I don't know if this is a silly question but when you were saying semi-standard am I right in thinking you were saying I thought MM 111 was also I mean is it the same thing as semi-dwarf? You're saying 16 feet and that's what I'm thinking semi-dwarf usually goes to. Okay so those words are actually vague uh, yeah. if we really get into it that's what they used but, to. but when we say dwarf we're, we're typically talking of the anywhere from the tomato size plant, yeah. which is M, is that M27? I think so. Uh, which I like to grow trees, so why would I bother with a tomato size plant? <laughs> but dwarf is that category of maybe up to 8, 10 feet. And semi dwarf, semi dwarf is more like. Again, these are vague terms. So you call it semi-standard. 
I try to distinguish that kind of 50% 60% size trees from the 75 85% so I use those words semi dwarf semi standard and then seedling and even with seedling trees um, one of the seedling rootstocks that's often used is Ankanopka, which is a Russian variety. And Ankanopka tends to have, its seeds tend to grow a tree that is about 90% vigor. So they're not quite as vigorous as others. Um, often a lot of these seedlings were whatever was squeezed for cider, and those are the seeds that grew out of the, the pumice pile, or they were thrown on the compost, and in the course of the winter they grew up. So that's the big end of it. On the small end, um, one real advantage is if, if you plant your dwarf trees where you garden, um, that whole notion of keeping the tree more open on each side, not having to get into lots of heavy mulch, um, the fact that you are hilling potatoes or cultivating garlic or mulching garlic or growing peas and the peas are all picked by early July and now you're going to plant oats as a winter cover crop. You're doing things to keep it more open. So that's a really nice thing to kind of tie together for a home orchardist if you want to work with smaller size trees. We should walk into... Oh, Michael, what about the top? What would you do with that? One, I'd get a bigger ladder. <laughs> I like to climb trees. I know, climbing trees. But climbing trees with a bucket, a 40-pound bucket of apples around your neck is, a, is another it's thing, too. It's getting harder, yes, it is. Um, let's say we didn't want to change the height radically on this tree. Um, right up there at the top where sunshine is hitting some side branches, you know, this is a lot harder to do when there's leaves on the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another branch that's, that's kind of going up and coming out, the highest branch on that tree. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd probably remove that one just to drop things down a little bit lower, but not radically. Now, if I wanted to really radically lower this tree, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd be coming down another few feet, um, even four or five feet. And, and now I'm talking about a tree that's probably going to be kept more at that cut is about 16 feet, but the growth response will fill it in at the top. I mean, you could work that. This is, this is all about a choice of what you want to do. What about maintaining the height but reducing the shading for the lower part of the tree? Well, that first cut I mentioned is to reduce the shading on that part. Mm. This branch is real. So when we talk about this notion of a single leader going up and scaffolds, what we're, we're kind of envisioning as fruit tree shapers <laughs> is a tree that's going to be more conical so that we're maximizing the surface area in the sunshine and over time if those upper branches and this is what Chris is talking about start to come out and overgrow the bottom branches they've lost the sunlight advantage so that shape is the ideal for maximizing surface area sunshine and often it's, it's out there in the direct sunshine, you get your very best fruit. So in this case, there's kind of a little gap here, but these upper branches are starting to reach out over. And that one in particular has that kind of feel to it. So I'd probably be cutting back to that first branch juncture. Mm -hmm. But again, it's hard to see this right now mm -hmm. when there's leaves here. But I'd, I'd try to be bringing the tree more into this. But all of what I'm talking about now is about trying to make these lower branches more fruitful. So you can kind of see this. I mean, you see a lot more fruit in the tops of these trees, and some of them have that bottom fruit, but more often than not, it's not quite as much because things are starting to overshadow. Mm -hmm. But we should, walk, mm -hmm. we should walk out there into the heart of it, Pat. <laughs> I got a lot of work ahead of me, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> we always have a lot of work. We'll go up to that now, tree. You know, <laughs> since you one of the the beautiful things here, this this permaculture, you call it permaculture. I, I call it diversity. Um, just having all these different flowering plants, the, having the Queen's Anne's lace, 
which it just attracts all kinds of little parasitic wasps, which in turn go and find the codling moth larvae and, and some of the eggs of other pests as well. And, and that's what balances a lot of those pest dynamics. What I, let, let's do the thinning talk up here because this, this tree is a little bit more loaded. I guess that's pretty loaded. Let's, let's go here. We don't have to go so far. <laughs> So some of you heard this yesterday, but some of you did not. So when an apple comes into bloom, every blossom cluster has five flowers. And some varieties, the bees tend to be really good at pollinizing all five flowers. And so every couple inches along the branch where there's a fruiting spur, there's five apples. And on those varieties that set particularly heavy, um, those five apples are growing 50 seeds. And those 50 seeds means that the levels of gibberellic acid hormone are really high right there at the end of the spur. And just as the fruit starts to go from the size of a pea to a marble to getting about this big, um, next year's flower cells are also being formed. And so if there's too many apples, which means there's too many seeds, you will not see flower cells form to give you return bloom next year. So in the wild, on an unmanaged tree, you see this often. There's this really bumper crop year, and then there's a total shutdown year. And it's not about some frost happened or something damaged the flowers. Um, it's about the fact that the flowers didn't even form in the first place. And that's actually an interesting question in terms of the biennialism of your trees. Are you, are you seeing pretty full cropping year after year? Or are you seeing more of a By good any, year, mm -hmm, knockdown year? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do in orcharding is come in and thin the apple crop so that there's a balance, so that there's energy, both nutrition and hormones, to form next year's flower cells. And that thinning effort, in terms of return bloom, has to take place in the 30 to 40 days once the petals have come off the tree. So fruit is just set. We're in the, the timely thinning window. And if, if we do it later in the summer, we'll help increase fruit size. But in that 30 to 40 day window, what I call the fruit sizing window, um, thinning is going to have an impact on giving us fruit next year. And in addition, it's at this point in the season that it's really obvious. Did this apple have a lot of scab on it or hardly any? Did this apple get hit by cuculeo? or did this apple get hit by codling moth? And so when we're thinning, we can start to edit our crop. It's a, it's a great, you know, as a writer, you, you'd like a good editor. And this is when you come in and you edit things to improve the quality of your crop. But if you do it in that 30, 40 day window, you're also starting to have an impact on next year's bloom. So this, this looks like a gala. Is this your gala? <laughs> um, you know, here's, gala tends to set most of its flowers. So here we have four fruits have set on here. So if, if we didn't come in here and thin, we would end up picking a lot of smallish fruits, which on a tree this size, maybe that's 10, 12 bushels of fruit, maybe 16 bushels of fruit. Um, on the other hand, if we came in and said, well, here I have approximately 20 leaves, which is good to grow one fruit. Now these, we have a lot of scab here you know, which is the one to, to grow. Um, this is almost really the end of the thinning window in terms of helping next year's bloom. But this one apple is going to get to be more this size. And we're also going to have enough energy to go into that spur tip to form flowers for next year. So coming in and thinning means basically starting with the notion that at any one point, I'm going to leave just one apple per cluster. And even that is probably not enough with a heavy setting variety like Gala. So when I look at this, I usually use my hand span as a judge. Each hand span represents enough leaves to grow a fruit. So often you'll read in the books, thin to every four to six inches apart. Um, on some varieties that are really ornery, like Baldwin, you might thin to more like eight, 10 inches apart um, because it just has a real biennial tendency. 
that's another way of kind of judging how many fruit to leave. But when you come to picking time, if you've thinned this tree, and this would be a job to get up there to do all that thinning and get out there to the tip branches, um, which is another reason why through pruning, if we keep the tree more compact and fruitful within, it's a lot easier to do this. Um, you're still going to pick the same amount of bushels, maybe even a bushel more, but they're all going to be nicer sized fruit. And the other thing that's going on at that point is the fact that through editing the crop, and particularly if there's a lot of insect issues, um, you can be taking these apples and feeding them to the chickens or the pigs or throwing them on a hard top road so cars drive over, over them and just smash all the larvae. Um, this is probably a good moment to start talking about some of the insect issues if we see, if we see them. <laughs> Mostly what I'm seeing here is scab. And shouldn't all the apples be removed and not, I mean, won't those re-scab the spores? I've been taking them out of here anyway, trying to. Once they're down there, they're not in a position, the apple shrivels, the nutritional value it changes. They're not really a source of canidia. So in the summer, secondary cycle of scab, it's up here in the tree and the canidia, not so much sporulating, they, they do do that, but even more so this apple up here with scab and the rain washing it down here to where there wasn't scab or making the scab worse. Mm -hmm. so, so mostly that's a up in the tree issue, that secondary cycle. Will this help, the one I brought? <laughs> It's got a little bit of everything. Okay, this, this one does have cuculeo. So, in terms of insects, even before we get to cuculeo, um, it's kind of nice to do this by walking through the season, what, what's coming. So, back in spring, when the fruit buds first started to show color, there are a number of what I call bud worms. Um, these are all surface feeding caterpillars of different moth species, be it oblique banded leaf roller or red banded leaf roller or green pug moth. There's a, there's a lot of choices and different sites see different ones. But I'm just going to group them all together, call them budworms. So in the spring, as the flowers of the apple start to open, um, if you look at those buds and you see a lot of chewing on the edges of the leaves or brown spots penetrating into the flower bud, or even leaves that are curled over themselves. That's what a leaf roller does. Because these are all surface feeding caterpillars, one of the, the sprays that I list on my, my holistic spray schedule is what's called the pink spray. And at that point in time, one of the tools that we can use in our organic toolbox is something called Bacillus thuringiensis. So BT is sold under the product name Dipel. There's other products as well. Um, BT does not last that long in terms of viability on the leaf. It's like three to five days. But because these are all surface feeding caterpillars, this is a great moment to get them and knock them back. So when we're dealing with moths, part of what you need to understand is if the first generation succeeds, then each female from that generation goes to lay 30 to 100 eggs. And so come the middle of summer, particularly where apples were not thinned and they're touching each other, the second round of leaf rollers often eat the surface of the skin of the fruit. And then when you go to pick what looks like two really good apples or three really good apples and you pull them apart, you see they're all eaten on the inside surface. So you're actually having a big impact on that because you do something about it in the spring when it's easy to take care of because they're feeding on the surface of leaves. So that is not a spray I'm going to make automatically every year, but I'm going to look. Are the buds being chewed? Does it feel like a strong presence? And if there is, I'm going to include BT in my holistic spray made it pink just because it's so very, very effective against that particular pest. So then we... If, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Sure. Uh, if you get your beneficial plantings up enough, the odds are good that your, your biocontrol would take care of most of that, right? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. And depends on the year. <laughs> it depends on the year. Sometimes something like moths can be blown in on a wind. Mm -hmm. 
And so when we talk about biocontrol, the fact that Queen's Anne's lace here and parasitic wasps are here and what have you, um, well, last year that had an impact on populations. But if something blows in in the spring, and you're going to see it by the feeding of those leaves, and also in this case, sometimes the timing of the earlier species of moths is before the parasites are at work. So when I talked about codling moth and, and how that exposed egg for 9 to 14 days is subject to this action, and then that larva coming out of the fruitlet to go find a place to hide at the base of the tree, um, the nuthatch is going to find it. The ground beetle or ants or wolf spiders are going to find it. That's a whole other scenario. There's a lot happening with that, where these earlier species sometimes can be out of hand and you may not have even ever seen the species that you get that given year. But if you think about them as bud moths and you look for chewing and it seems excessive, that's what I call the point of vulnerability of that particular species. And whenever I get in, and you're going to hear this as we go through these different insects that are possible pests here, um, you look at their life cycle. And in that life cycle, there is places where we have a opportunity to have more impact than not. So proceeding ahead, we come to bloom, everything looks really good, the bees do the pollination, and now there's fruit. And now things start to shift because there are fruit feeding pests, and those pests are going to, in some instances, some instances decimate the crop. In places like Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Kukulio, which is also here, can take away 95% of the crop when it's this size. And the larva cause the fruit to be aborted, cause the larva want to get into the soil. So Kukulio is a small weevil about 3 sixteenths of an inch long. And it has warts on its back and it has a curved snout. And Kukulio is something that both males and females make feeding stings into the developing fruit and the female is laying three to four eggs a night. So if you have a lot of Kukulio, three to four eggs a night adds up to a lot of larva. That's a lot of drop fruit before you're even thinking about harvesting and eating fruit. This is an insect that often does not overwinter well in the orchard itself. And that in part is due to the fact that leaves blow away. It's not a thick cover like in the forest. Now in a setting like this, um, and with the trees getting bigger and bigger, you probably see more leaf cover staying than you did in the earlier years when the trees weren't so big. So they might overwinter in the orchard, but typically they're gonna go into the forest litter um, of a hardwood tree grove. A lot of times they're gonna favor going in a southwest direction because that's where the sun sets um, to spend the winter. But if there's no hardwood trees there, they'll go north, they'll go east. It, it, it'll vary in different orchard settings. This little weevil comes back into the orchard every spring or emerges from the soil um, about the time of bloom. And if it's a cool spring, it'll be delayed. If it's a really warm spring, it, it might even come in before bloom. It's not going to do any damage at that point because there's no fruit to damage. But once the fruit's there and once the twilight temperatures um, in the evening hold at around 70 degrees, it becomes really, really active. And for about two weeks, that activity is going to take place. And one of the things that the Kukulio does is when it lays an egg, this is the plum Kukulio. So this is an insect that was native to North America, was quite happy in the plum thickets, I think. But once people planted domesticated apple, it was also quite happy to say, oh, I can do that fruit too. Oh, pears, love it, love it. Peaches, great, bring it on. Um, so it, it's a major, major pest in many respects. This is not something they have in the West Coast. This is, this is a blessing of living in the East. And that's because we have the hardwood forest. And the, the, the prairie states, the Great Plains, is nothing they've ever crossed. Um, but when it lays its egg, it cuts a little crescent scar to slow down the development of the, the growth of the fruit cells around the egg to give the egg time to hatch. And when that egg is infertile, or literally gets crushed by the fruit cells, then that crescent scar, um, there's no larva in there, 
but this particular blemish grows out looking like a big russeted half moon, quarter moon. So if, if you don't know if you have Kukuleo, but you see this quarter moon blemish on your fruit, you have Kukuleo, and chances are you have Kukuleo. So in terms of understanding the life cycle of this insect, the eggs that hatch, um, those fruitlets are gonna be aborted. So they drop to the ground. And in the course of a week or two, that larva is going to crawl out of the apple and go into the soil to pupate. And it's going to be down under the ground for probably three weeks. It's going to emerge in late July. It might go and feed on a few more fruits, but that's by August, mid-August, it's going to find its place where it's going to hibernate for the winter. And it's going to do that under leaf cover or in a stone wall, um, any place that it can hide from the cold. So what are the points of vulnerability of Kukulio? One is the fact that during the feeding egg laying time, it tends to drop to the ground during the day. During the day, Kukulio often will drop back down to the ground cover to hide. Not guaranteed, but often will. So one of the methods to work with Kukulio that was developed in the 18, middle 1800s um, was there was actually three factories making these wheelbarrows with this big inverted umbrella which had a slot and they would ram it in against the trunk of the tree and that jarring motion would cause Kukulio to drop. Dawn was the preferable time to do it and they would roll down the inverted umbrella into a jar of kerosene. And there was actually three factories making devices like this for people to jar the trees. Um, Similarly, there are some growers who, in an orchard setting, know that maybe well, Liberty is, is one such variety. Uh, there's certain varieties that seem more attractive. And during the two weeks of Kukuleo time, when they're most active, uh, and again, that starts with an evening in the 70 degrees, going out each morning and laying tarps underneath those trees. And sometimes people put an actual put a spike in the trunk of the tree and hit it with a baseball bat. And that jarring causes them to drop, and then you clean up the tarps. Now that's, that's very intensive, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but the fact that Kukulio pupates in the soil is another opportunity. So when insect pests like Kukulio and European apple sawfly and apple maggot fly, they all pupate in the soil, that doesn't really seem like a point of vulnerability because they are well, they could be anywhere. <laughs> and what are you going to do about it? You can't find them down there in the ground. But if you have trees, they really prefer varieties. Or one of the tools in our, I, I call it the organic toolbox, one of the spray materials we might choose to use is something called surround, which is a refined kaolin clay. And so the, the clay works basically because the particles were refined to a really small size that they can get into the eyeballs and the armpit and the reproductive parts of the Kukuleo and it makes it very uncomfortable. It wants to go somewhere else. So when you understand that dynamic, if you leave a tree or two unsprayed, they have a place to go. And these trap trees, they're not so much sacrificial trees, that, that may be the case for a year or two, but these trap trees are a place where you might do the tarp thing. Or knowing that you see a lot of pressure, a lot of damage, a lot of these scars, you see a lot of fruitlets drop. The fact that they're in the ground for three plus weeks is an opportunity under those trees to come in with something like parasitic nematodes. So these are little organisms that go and parasitize insects, pupa, in the soil. And there's different species that work one to two inches and another species that goes two to four inches. You know, to do that throughout this whole orchard would be very daunting and expensive. But if you were using it in conjunction with the surround clay spray, which is going to push them to the place where they're going to find it, they're going to, they, you can almost hear them say, ha, she missed this one. Let's go here, boys. Um, that's where they're going to funnel. And now suddenly something like that becomes effective. Similarly, if you time it, as the little fruitlets are dropping, and you bring in your chickens, and for two weeks they live under those trap trees, they're gonna find most of those larvae. If you say to your chickens, okay, 
girls go throughout this whole orchard and find all the cuculea. They don't work that way. They like, we like it here. We might go over here, but it's, it's random. There was an orchard in um, Wisconsin and Turkey Ridge was the name. And their approach was they had about 100 acres of trees, were committed to doing things organically. And this was before surround was available. So, so they got like a thousand used up egg layers. And so that was very inexpensive. And they released them in their 100 acres. And the result was not really cuculeo control, but actually feeding foxes. They, the foxes got to really have a good time in that setting. But the weak point of that plan was saying to go everywhere. But if you bring them in under those trap trees and you put up a fence and you keep them in that area and throw some cornmeal, that's another way. And it's all based on the fact that they want to get into the ground. So that's, that's the moment we have access to knocking back the populations. And, and if we're doing the trap tree approach, or in your case, if you, again, you know that that variety and this variety and that particular apple seem to be so much harder hit than the others, if you treat them like trap trees, even though you're not doing the clay, and you're doing some form of understory management, then you start to limit the successful ones that are gonna come back for next year. And, and this is the way you begin to get it to a more reasonable balance point. You know, if, if your neighbor has trees and they're unmanaged, that's a population that's gonna move in and that's harder to do. But if, if you have more of a, your own little ecosystem scene, and you certainly do here, surrounded by the, the mountains and the forest, that's a way to start to knock things back. And, and the other point of, of the clay is if you did that strategy and you sprayed everything, well, this is a species and it wants to exist. It has to reproduce and it has to feed. And rather than getting its job done in two weeks, it'll wait for six, eight, ten weeks, still trying to get to your fruit because there's nowhere to go that's not covered with the clay. So you, you almost have to have that outlet so the insect can do that. Um, I do use the, the clay spray. And this year, with one application, I was able to knock it back. And partly that's my years of working with neem oil has also had some impact on the populations. But also we had a really, really cold winter, and I don't think as many survived. So I didn't have the usual, this is going to last two to three weeks. I could see that it was ending. Um, is that two sprays, Michael, or one spray together? Neem in. Okay, so in terms of some of the, I'll say it, in terms of some of these sprays, we have to think about their attributes. So in the case of clay, this works by flaking off. So if we applied the clay with an oil, that would stick it to the tree. So the, the, the flaking off aspect would not work mm -hmm. as well. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky. In those 30 to 40 days after petal fall, we have scab ending its cycle. We have cedar apple rust continuing throughout that whole time. We have the beginning of the summer diseases and the summer fruit rots looking to get established. We have cuculeo coming into the orchard. We have codling moth laying its eggs and those larvae hatching in turn. And that 30, 40 days when we're thinning the crop is actually the busiest in terms of disease and insect management as well. So when I talk about spraying the holistic spray, which includes neem oil and liquid fish and seaweed and effective microbes, and there's variations on that, um, that's mostly aimed at boosting the immune function of the tree and getting competitive colonization, getting other microbes to defeat the pathogens on the surface of the fruit and the leaf. In between those sprays, which at that point in the season, there's a lot of intensity, and I'm, I'm doing petal fall spray and first cover seven days later and the next spray another seven to 10 days later. In between those sprays, when cuculeo is showing up, I have to do the clay spray separate. So that's so that it flakes off. And then I have to renew it the next week after that holistic spray. So that sounds really intense. But on the other hand, in your handouts um, today, I, I've given you my sp actual spray record for this season. And you can kind of see how I fit it in there. Um, I don't have that in my, my hand, but if I look at it. So right, right now we're in that petal fall window and I'm using the clay for cuculeo. Now, 
I don't know what degree you experience codling moth here. Do you feel, I haven't seen any codling moth yet, signs of codling moth. Do you know, do you see that hole in apples this size with orange poop coming out the side at this time of year? Not very often, but. When you pick apples in the fall and you take a bite out of an apple, do you often see half a worm in the piece of the apple still that you haven't eaten? <laughs> Not that, often. Okay, so you may not have a lot of codling moth, and that has a lot to do with the diversity mm -hmm. that you have here. Mm -hmm. You know, it exactly ties in, because now we have a later species when a lot of this is in gear. Um, codling moth is different than those budworms I mentioned earlier, and it's different because it is one of the internal feeders. Within 24 hours of hatching, that little larva gets inside the fruitlet. 24 hours is not a big window to have an impact on that larva. Um, and again, because the egg's out there for a while and the larva tries to go to the, the trunk of the tree, there are points of vulnerability in codling moth's life cycle as well. And the fact that it wants to get to the trunk of the, the tree to get under the scaly bark back in the 1800s led to the idea of tying a braid, twisted braid of hay beneath the first level of branches and another at the ground level. And this is because the worm is either crawling out of the apple and coming down the trunk to the scaly bark, or the apple's falling to the ground or the worm parachuted out and it's crawling across the ground to get to the scaly bark at the trunk. And it's gonna pupate on the order of 10 to 14 days. And if you know the cycle and you know the timing, and you've got all this diversity keeping numbers pretty reasonable to begin with, you can go in about, in my case, this would be the last two weeks of June, and you can check the modern equivalent of the hay braid is corrugated cardboard, so six inch band of cardboard duct taped around the tree. You can check, is there a lot of moths pupating in here? And throw those infested cardboard bands out or burn them. Um, they did that with the hay braids. But again, it's all based about what's the timing? What's the cycle? Where does it go? Is there a place that makes sense? You know, I have 300 plus trees. I don't do the cardboard band. I don't know that if you had a codling moth problem, <laughs> I don't know that you would get into it. I mean, that's if you have enough interns, you might get that achieved. <laughs> um, but if you're in the home orchard and you've got diversity and all these good things working for you, Maybe that's all the nudge you need to start to really clean up the numbers. Now, part of this spray plan also includes the use of neem oil. And earlier I mentioned how it's the terpenoids that help stimulate the immune response. Um, neem also contains fatty acids, which really feed the good microbes, both on the surface of the, the tree and also in the ground. And neem also contains these compounds called azoderactins. And azoderactins inhibit the molting cycle of insects. So that's that whole process of going from egg to first instar larva, to second instar larva, to third instar larva, eventually to an adult form. So in my spray schedule, um, working with the holistic sprays for disease, the very first spray is also sprayed quite heavily on the trunk and on the ground underneath the tree. So part of that is I'm trying to add fats to decompose leaves to have less disease, um, but part of that is having an impact on any codling moth that are still there behind the scaly bark. And over the course of doing this for several years, I've really knocked back those numbers as well. Another thing that happens with these holistic sprays, which are mostly about nutrition and mostly about disease, neem drips into the soil underneath the trees. And they actually have used neem soil drenches in Ayurvedic agriculture, because neem comes from India, um, to get insects that pupate in the soil. So that's, that's another thing that contributes. I mean, what I like about this whole plan is that it's, it's like a tapestry. We're weaving all these threads together and we're, we're working with immune function. We're working with competitive colonization. We're suppressing particularly moths. Now, neem does not work on cuculeo. Can anyone tell me why? It's, it's an adult that's doing the feeding stings and laying the eggs and there's no impact on adults. Should it have an anti-feedant effect though? There's a slight anti-feeding impact on those insects that eat leaves. 
the, on the surface of the fruit when you're putting your proboscis in to get a, a, a drink or you're putting your ovipositor to lay the egg, you're not ingesting. So there's a difference in that respect. So with something like Japanese beetle, maybe there is enough of a nudge and we'll get to brown marmorated stink bug real soon now. Maybe there's enough of a nudge to push them in a certain direction. But because they're feeding on the fruit, it's, it's different than feeding on the leaf. That impact changes. And so a follow-up question to that, um, which I doubt that you have tried to do, and I don't know that it would work for something as big as this, but I learned from Richard McDonald that you can actually get neem to go systemic. And that's usually helpful for us with things like spider mite infestations and stuff. You just see these little balls of spider mites on the end of the leaf. They got nowhere to eat. They just don't know what to do. You know, they just, they all leave. I wondered if you had ever thought or heard of anybody trying to use the ability of the garlic to cause things to go through the membrane to get trees to have a systemic neem effect. So when Patrick brings up the garlic, that's, that's part of an herbal tea brew that I do. And garlic helps pass nutrients through a membrane, through the the foliage cells in, into the interior of the leaf. Um, and because neem is a fat, that also helps its absorption qualities. It goes into the bark. And this whole idea of how long does a holistic spray last, the impact of it. Um, on average, I think 10 days is a good way to think about it. And when the disease pressures are intense, I tighten things up to seven days because and again, it depends where you're growing, what are you facing in terms of disease pressure, um, and knowing when that window is more intense and when it's not as intense, you spread things out more. To the extent that the Azer Duractans are taken into the leaf, I have no knowledge, but that's what you're talking about when you say systemic. Mm -hmm. And that may be that for a few days that is true. Um, I think of it more as the neem oil coating lasting on the surface but th it's possible that that's taken in see with the with the um, plant i mean the like eggplant and stuff we literally just drench the ground and it goes into the plant yeah that's in the system and that seems like you go bankrupt trying to do that with the tree i mean so that's why i wondered if you could have that impact by using the garlic to, you know, but just a thought it might help uh -huh. but but these are the unknowns yeah. the known knowns and the unknown unknowns <laughs> <laughs> will neem kill my honeybees though so whenever we talk about a spray, we have to think about all the aspects of it. So when I talk about neem inhibiting the molting cycle of insects, honeybees are insects. It's not gonna hurt the bee gathering the honey, that's an adult. But if they carry enough neem back to the hive, that could have an impact. So now we come into, if we look a little closer at this spray schedule, um, at pink, there's no bees working the blossoms of my flowers. I spray neem, I'm not worried about that. At petal fall, there still might be a few flowers on some varieties, but for the most part, the bees are also done up in the tree. During bloom, if I need to spray, I don't use neem. There's other things I spray, and, and that has to do with the risk of fire blight or is there a rain event that's gonna cause scab? I might supplement my sprays. and so you can't just give a prescription and say this is what you do you know i, I give a guideline template um, that was part of yesterday's handout which will be available on the living web farms website eventually um, but that template doesn't mean you do all those sprays or that it's talked about everything you need to do at your site particularly until you get things more in balance so now it ties into what are you dealing with what's the disease where is its launching pad? So in the case of scab, it's from the leaves. Um, in the case of the, the rots on the fruit, some of it is from any mummified fruit that are still there. So when you're, you prune, you ideally go and remove the mummified fruit. Same with brown rot on peaches and plums. Those mummified fruit are one of the sources of that disease getting reestablished in the new season. Um, but we all have to think about the reality at our site and every site's different and every year is different. You know, one of the things Chris or, and Michelle said once was, you know, it isn't like we have to get nine out of 10 things right as we go about this. As organic growers, if we really want a crop that 
has a pretty good grade, a pretty good finish, and we can sell the majority of it market, we have to get 20 out of 20 things right. So it's, it's, it's a real dance because so many things can go wrong. And if, if you overlook, and this makes it sound like a great reason not to orchard, but if you overlook one thing like protecting a young tree with a, a guard around the trunk to prevent voles from girdling it in the winter and then the next spring the snow melts and you see all your trees got girdled, you know, you overlook something really, really important. <laughs> so you can recover from a bad codling moth year or you can recover from a bad scab year and you start to learn how to enhance leaf decomposition so there's less of those spores. As you get into warmer climates, and that would not, I don't think, be the case for you, but maybe down closer to the coast in North, South, South Carolina, scab overwinters not just on the ground, but some of those late forming canidia are in the bud scales. And so scab launches from the tree itself. I think that you probably experience that part of the cycle in Australia, in California, a similar thing. So that just adds a new complexity about that disease because you're in a place where that can happen. On the other hand, <laughs> as you start to, we talked about the whip and gr growing those branches. Um, when each of us plants a fruit tree and starts to work trying to grow fruit, we're whips. And we have several years to grow good, strong branches. You have several years, you have decades to start to learn. This is a part of the, what I need to know in my site at this place with the pests, with the challenges I face here. And it becomes simpler. Doesn't sound like it's gonna become simpler, but it becomes simpler as you realize by planting this echinacea and letting Queen's Anne's lace grow and having milkweed is another great plant. The more diversity you have, the more species of beneficial insects. And suddenly those overwhelming codling moth years in the early portion of the orchard, it's less and less of an issue. And, and if you are working with neem, that's gonna have some impact in that direction. Um, here and not working with neem, it's, it's all about natural advantage. And it suits you and what you need from this orchard to make your living. And, and that's beautiful. You know, it's, that's another part. It's, it's not like we all have to grow 100% beautiful fruit. You know, my goal is to grow something in the range of 60 to 90 percent, what's the word I like to use, fruit that's decent enough to eat. Now that also involves educating people because when they freak out over one or two scab spots or one Kukulio crescent, which is really like a badge of honor in that it survived, it made it through, um, when they freak out over one raised russeted dimple which is probably caused by a tarnished plant bug when it was a bud in fruit and it did a feeding sting into the developing fruitlet before you even saw it there's no bug behind there you know it's not an issue so part of it is getting people to understand not only is it not an issue but fruit that goes through some challenges produces more phyto compounds that we also benefit from and when patrick talks about your fruit being very nutrient dense and, and just filled with so much goodness. That's part of having some scab. That's part of having some insect pressure because the trees respond in turn. So, you know, long ago I identified the biggest challenging, the biggest challenge in orcharding was not the fungal disease or the fire blight or the cuculeo. It was the human perception of what makes the perfect apple. And I've realized that I have to really teach people. You know, my customers have to hear my rap. I get it down to under a minute, but they have to understand. And if they don't hear the words, they taste the fruit and it's the flavor that really convinces them. And then they start to see there's something to all this, how all these pieces fit together. Questions? My, my brain has had two days of <laughs> guiding things. Oh, I didn't get to, okay, good. We'll go back to insect. So a little edit there. Um, ideally, you come through this fruit sizing window and codling moth has been knocked back. And when I spray the clay, that limits some of the egg laying just because the codling moth female 
through our antenna and through the pads in our feet feels this really slippery surface. So that's been part of my knocking back codling moth in my orchard. Um, in a bigger orchard, they have some tools that they'll use, uh, things like mating disruption. And this is also a point of vulnerability. During bloom, the male needs to find the female. And he does that because the female releases a pheromone scent. Mating disruption is taking that same pheromone scent, which has been synthesized. It's impregnated into little twist tie lures that may be anywhere from 200 to 400 per acre are put out there. And if the orchard is big enough and contiguous enough, it floods the whole area with the scent of the female. And you have these males like, where is she? Where is she? I can't find her. I can't find her. Where is she? And mating doesn't happen. So in some settings, that works. And, and it can work in an orchard as small as an acre if it's not a place where the wind is always blowing it out. But typically, they recommend it be four acres. So it's, it's not something we do on a home orchard scale. Um, part of your handout is some options for Lepidoptera. So that's the moths. And um, I mentioned how BT is really useful for surface feeders. In another way, neem oil has an impact on all of them. Um, but if, if codling moth gets out of hand, there is another disease of that particular species called granulosis virus. And if an orchardist experiences a real problem, um, you might introduce that virus during the two to four weeks after petal fall. It's going to get most of the first generation, but also then exist into the next generation. So that's a very impactful tool, but it's very targeted. And if, if you had a huge problem, that might be something you consider. But it, it's as you learn about the spray options, it, it's you got to learn that not every year do you do the same thing. As things start to get better or shift or there's a bad year. So people are having a bad year now with things like brown marmorated stink bug or Japanese beetle when it first comes on the scene. I've seen a few Japanese beetles here, but it hasn't, doesn't seem overwhelming, I think. Mm -hmm. I think what you have is the tulip poplar advantage mm -hmm. in that the tulip poplar supports a beneficial called the spring tiffia wasp. And tiffia are really good at finding Japanese beetle grubs in the soil and laying their egg to consume that grub. And that's because you have the right kind of species mm -hmm. in the ecosystem to support a really good ally. But anyway, when they first move in, mm -hmm. they can really target plants and they have certain preferences. So Japanese beetle, it's things like the grapes and the red clover and the green beans and raspberry and honey crisp apple seems to be one of its favorites in, in that regard. And you can adapt, some people tell me plums or cherries. I mean, they feed on a lot of different things, but given their druthers, they seem to have some preferences. Similarly, brown marmorated stink bugs have some preferences. So pumpkins are in that group, potentially summer squash. Patrick was saying cleome. I'm, I'm not, I haven't seen the stink bug on cleome or clematis. Patrick's not here, so I'm not sure what he told me. But anyway, there are plants that you see them gather on. And you are trying to grow other plants, particularly pears, particularly your apples, that they're making these feeding stings on and causing this kind of sunken depression, corky flesh. Um, and you'd like to see less of that. The way to work with insects like that is to realize, OK, there's feeding preferences. And because neem has some anti-feeding qualities, it's, it's not something you can depend on. But because, and especially if you're using it in an integrated way, you make it less attractive to the insect. And by pushing it, and you might be literally growing pumpkins in your orchard to do this, not to grow pumpkins. A trap crop in this case is something about get them there where they have a preference to begin with, but also nudge them away from what you're trying to do so that there is a place you can do something far more heavy hitting than you might want to do elsewhere. Now, what is that far more heavy hitting thing? Um, one of the materials in the organic toolbox is a pyrethrum, which is the daisy flower based product called pyganic. Now, pyganic is not something I would want to spray throughout the orchard, 
because it impacts many, many different species. It only lasts about four hours. It breaks down in sun, sunlight. Um, but on the other hand, if I have a trap crop, I'm not as adverse to spray that with pyganic. And now we take that nuance a little bit further. If that pyganic spray includes some diatomaceous earth, the diatomaceous earth, these are very sharp, small particles from a sea deposit. Um, when the tarnished plant bug is in that mist, it breathes in the spray. And the diatomaceous earth cuts its thorax. And so the pyganic, it's almost like a hypodermic needle. It makes the pyganic that much more effective. Now Patrick was telling me you can also take something like insecticidal soap, MPed, and do it at twice the rate, which you would not do in your trees. It would hurt the foliage. It would hurt good bugs as well. But on a trap crop, which you're not trying to grow the pumpkins, doubling that rate of insecticidal soap, it's not going to kill the marmorated, brown marmorated stink bug on day one. But by day three, its exoskeleton is going to be dissolved and it's going to become dehydrated and die. And again, you wouldn't do something like this everywhere, but as you start to understand these dynamics, hopefully you can figure out what's the right plant to grow to really draw it. And if you need to do some repellent aspect, like another repellent aspect for Japanese beetle, if you're really trying to establish grapes or you're of young apple trees and they really seem to be hitting them, well, that's another use of the surround kaolin clay because it's, it's not going to kill the beetle, but it's going to make it not happy. And now it might appreciate that trap crop all the more. And then if you really like drama, you can get a flamethrower. And that's what you hit the pumpkins with. <laughs> or the grapes that are the trap crop for Japanese beetle. Can you use diatomaceous earth with the clay? Would that have any advantage to I don't think there would be an advantage to adding diatomaceous earth to the clay because that tiny kakulio, it's not as likely to be, here I'm, it's a bigger bug and it's going into its breathing tubes and cutting the tissue. That tiny kakulio, it's not going to flake off. It's not, it's not going to work the same. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, that does not mean that you shouldn't try your ideas and see if, wow, this really works better. Michael Phillips doesn't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Because we all like start, as we think about it and understand how each thing works, that might be a great idea. I understand diatomaceous works by cutting the exoskeleton too, like in the gale. Right. And then they just dehydrate. But I think of that more for a, a soft-bodied bug. So in yeah. the case of clay and spraying it for kakule, it's a really hard little critter. I don't, I don't, that doesn't rule it out, but I don't think it'll be as, as useful. But it's, that's something to think about, and it, I may be wrong. Then another bug, insect, um, you are likely to face are a series of borers. So if you're growing apples, there's a borer beetle called the round-headed apple tree borer. And that beetle lands in the tree and crawls down the trunk and puts as many as seven eggs in the base of a little tree the size of my thumb, which that grub hatches out and is in there for two years eating the cambium of the bark. And if you've ever lost a young tree that just seemed to snap off, go down to the base of the tree and you'll probably see all this chewing and, and holes in the wood and orange frass was probably the borer. It, it wouldn't be the flathead borer. Or the flathead borer is another variation that is drawn usually to damaged areas on the bark. So like where the bark is exposed to excessive sunlight or there's been a mechanical pruning injury. But or not at the base of the tree necessarily. Not every flathead borer has read the right book. So you may see some laid at the soil line, but mostly... I've, I've had problems with them, so it must be... The at the soil line? line? Yes. If it's at the soil line, it's pretty much probably the round-headed borer. Now similarly, if you're growing peaches, there are moths whose grub phase is a borer. And so here we have the peach tree borer and the lesser peach tree borer. Their timing's a little bit different. So depending on the pest, you have to go to the life cycle. What's the timing? When are they laying eggs? And what I have taken to doing as the most effective approach to borer is to do a botanical trunk spray of the neem oil. When I mix the holistic core recipe to spray into the foliage, that's at a 0.5% concentration. 
When I do a trunk spray, I am literally covering from the first branches down, because sometimes the borer will lay its egg not at the soil line, but a little bit up. I'm literally going from the first branches down, so I'm not spraying foliage, and I'm literally puddling it around the base of the tree so that these fats with the azoodiractins are going to soak into the tissues. And I make, in my case, I aim to make that first spray at the third week of June, another one in the middle of July. The timing here is probably such that you might make it in the first or second week of June and the end of June and again in mid-July. Just because it, it happens here sooner than it does where I am up in northern New Hampshire. What you're doing is you're impacting any grubs that might be there from the year before with a high level of neem and the azoodiractins, but the neem is also acting as an egg-laying deterrent to the beetles. So this timing is about when the beetle comes to go lay its eggs. With that, you still need to look anytime you go under your tree, you know, take a moment. Do you see frass? And if you do, take your knife and try to get it. Um, but over the course of a couple of years of using trunk sprays, you'll start to see a big reduction in the amount of borers that are on your site. And this is a pest that is, you might have this big problem at your place. You might live five blocks away or on the other side of the hill and have no, no borers at all. So it is a very localized thing. You probably don't have borers here, unless you tell me that you lost a dozen trees or so in the early years of this orchard. Did you? I didn't lose them, but they were, we, we They're here. put wires in there and tried to yeah. get the borers out. And do you still mm -hmm. see much? Not anymore. They yeah. tend, once the tree gets big enough, mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean they're not here, but they, they don't mm -hmm. seem as overwhelming. They, they don't like the harder, scaly bark. I've seen, I've seen them on the uh, limbs, little stems too, or s I think that's what that is. Some kind of boring insect. On the what? On the stems, of, uh, you know, some branches, some limbs. Would that be boring? Those would be boring? Do you see that boring into apple shoots sometime the tail end of bloom or even during bloom or another point in the season? Recently, actually, um, last couple of weeks. There's a cousin of codling moth called oriental fruit moth. It's also an internal feeder. An oriental fruit moth um, has multiple generations. The first generation and perhaps the second in attacking apples do not go after the fruit, but instead go into a, a newly growing, growing shoot. Mm -hmm. And it might be two, might be five, six inches back, and they bore into the stem and they eat the pith, mm -hmm. and basically the cambium. And everything beyond that turns brown and dies. And so it's like a flag, mm -hmm. but it's usually during bloom or the mm -hmm. maybe up to the month following. You're in the mountains, maybe it's delayed, but that, that would be the first thing that I would suspect mm -hmm. of what you're talking about. What is it called again? Because I think I have it too. Oriental fruit, Oriental fruit moth. Moth, okay. Mm -hmm. The next generation, if peaches are in hand, tends to go for the peaches. And in stinging the peaches, the peach has this gum response. Mm -hmm. And that opening, if the larva of the moth doesn't destroy the peach, is an entry point for brown rot. So it makes things a lot worse. But eventually, by the third or fourth generation, it now targets the apple fruit. And I've seen some chewing on the calyx ends of some of your apples. We'll see if I can find it again. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see a lot of it. But that was what I was thinking when I saw it, mm -hmm. that you might have that here. And if you're seeing that flagging stage, mm -hmm. you probably do. Now, is it bad? Um, is it overwhelming for you? I'm not seeing a lot of it, but you'd have to observe this through the season. But again, the advantage of biodiversity is having species that find it. Okay. And one of those species of braconids is the macrocentris, which if you have a lot of oriental fruit moth, you want to grow a patch of sunflowers. And hopefully that sun, those sunflowers are going to be subject to sunflower moth, which is a problem for sunflowers, but it is a food resource for macrocentris. And if, if you have enough wisdom to not feel like you've got to make everything cleaned up and neat going into winter and you leave the sunflower stalks in place, mm -hmm. 
Well, that is a place where this brachinid can overwinter, mm -hmm. and by the time oriental fruit moth is getting your apples the next August, it'll find 80% of them. And that, that's all about understanding that mm -hmm. beneficials need food resources and overwintering places. Mm -hmm. And in the case of this species, which gets a major pest, it's all about sunflower debris being left through the winter. If, if sunflower moth goes after Jerusalem artichokes, they would do perfectly well as well. And you might have that dynamic going on. And, you know, a lot of this we have no clue, but it's, it's the little bit we do know is kind of cool. And it's like, yeah. yeah, so I don't know if sunflower moth goes after Jerusalem artichoke or the sun choke, but that's of that family, and that might be the case. And that might be why I see so very little so far of something like that. Hmm. Does anyone know the time? Yes, it is 10 minutes till 5 o'clock. Oh, and we're going to when? Well, we started at really like almost an hour late, so I don't know, but um, many of us not here, but um, I'm what? assuming we'd go late since we started late, everybody, but probably Could Meredith and um, Pat have some idea when they want to go have everyone. I'm happy to continue to talk and, and, and do stuff, but if we're going to do that, I'd like to get a drink. So let's take one of those official five-minute breaks. Yeah. Yeah. You ready? Oh, okay. You want to see the... Are we going to the tree? Let's go see no. what you want to show we're going, us. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to... Let's see. Here's my ladder. Um, if you dare to go under the ladder. <laughs> Here's the tree. I, w I will point out this, with this orchard ladder, you know, this is steep terrain. A tripod ladder is really secure if you get the bottom two feet somewhat level on, on ground terrain like that. Whereas if you took a step ladder like you normally paint with or clean the gutter with four legs, that's totally dangerous. So. Investing in a tripod ladder is really useful. Okay, it's... This is a, a semi-dwarf that I planted without much knowledge about how to plant it really, really yeah. well. So that's why it's leaning, I, I believe. And you can talk about that too if you want to. And then I, it's got... Um, some of them are even worse. It's beginning to form a black thing there, yeah. and then it so ruins the fruit. And yeah. Make it shorter. Yeah. <laughs> this, to me, That's is probably likely a calic moth. Oh, so okay. seventy-five percent of the first generation will go in mm -hmm. through the calyx, and this is just the frass as it consumes the flesh in the interior and, and eats the seeds. And if mm -hmm. if Someone has a knife and we cut it open, we'll probably find That's the larva. Be careful, very sharp. That's not what I, I was going to, wanting to show you, but um, it might be the cause. Are you looking at this also? It might be the cause. Are you looking for this kind of thing? Right That's here above his head? Oh, yeah. That's it. If you look on this side. Mm, no? No, something mo more than that. This tree's got loaded with stuff, but it's not good. Well, maybe that was the exit hole. I don't see him. There's one up here. Right the black, the yeah, black, black. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm right talking about. I think that was the exit hole, because he's gone. Yeah. Come up oh, but now we know you have coddling moth. It is, or is it? Yeah. It, mm -hmm. I didn't find him, but that's mm -hmm. coming in and b yeah. doing a big cavity, yeah. and mm -hmm. eventually eating the seeds. That's what the larva is after. <laughs> and this is the time of year that they're going to get to the soil and head towards the trunk. Had that one with the big blacks, hard up there, and we're looking at. Up here, Michael. Just look between those two branches. Right there. Right there. <laughs> Are we looking on an apple? It's, yeah, yeah uh -huh. it's big brown right. spot on the base. Now, when I step back, you might see it better. Yeah. There, he oh, right. because the, the branch went right over. Okay. It's like blossom end rot on a tomato. Yes. Right there. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh. Got to race, yeah, race the dog. Yeah. 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 
never seen that. It's odd. <laughs> so this, this is obviously a rot. <laughs> now, is it bitter rot? Is it black rot? I'm not sure. It's not cedar apple rust because I'm not seeing any signs of the orange spots and doesn't seem to be eastern red cedar around here. But the rots, just like the summer disease, which I saw the beginning signs of sooty blotch and fly speck on some of these apples. Um, and similarly, if you're growing stone fruit, and so that rot is called brown rot. Um, these are all diseases that have to get through the cuticle that covers the fruit. And in the case of sooty blotch and fly speck, they actually feed on the cuticle. So this is where I get into working with herbal teas. So the horsetail tea that I do, nettle when it's in seed, are really rich in silica. And the comfrey tea, and using green nettle, it's very rich in calcium. And, and I'm adding microbes to these brews and humates, and in the case of the calcium tea, also some gypsum and some raw milk. And if, if you're into, be, into the male essence, you can't, get any, you can't go any further with with the essence of what you smell like when you spray these sprays, because they're, they're pretty strong. Um, my wife is embarrassed if I go to town on a spray day, so I have to be tuned into that. And, and add the fish, it just, it just gets richer. <laughs> um, but what I'm doing is, if this is black rot, it is coming from that dead wood, where it may be a dead branch in the tree, or a pile of prunings. If this is bitter rot, it's probably coming from a mummified fruit. So like a variety like Cortland holds a lot of those little, doesn't size everything out. Um, if it's brown rot, it's coming from those mummified peaches and plums and cherries, which in turn caused a blossom infection already this spring, which is now there's a canker at the base of those blossom clusters that turned brown. That's where spores are coming from. So they're going to come. And you can clean up some of the mummified fruit, but if you spend time in this past 30, 40 day window, what I call the fruit sizing window, um, and you strengthen that cuticle by building silica and calcium levels, and, and there are spray products you can buy. You don't have to brew the teas, but you know, it's pretty cool if you can use plants that like comfrey <laughs> that grow here on your farm, in your farmscape as part of the approach of dealing with what can be a major disease. So in a really wet year, rots can really get out of hand and you can lose a lot of that crop. Um, it's all about boosting that cuticle defense, boosting silica and calcium levels. With that, there's also the piece about the biology. And so compost tea or effective microbes are part of my sprays at this point in the year because if I put a crowd of organisms on there, the rot spores are far less likely to be able to compete with that. And so between the silica and the calcium and a crowd being yeasts and lactic acid bacteria and whatever you find in compost tea, you get a big leg up on the ability of that spore to, to get going on this. So you've probably seen years like Empire can have a lot of issues with rot. You have Empire, I think. Mm -hmm. do, do you see Empire having an issue with bitter rot or? Okay. And so those are the types of things that go into thinking about that. I mean, it's here again, without spraying, you can only clean up so many mummified fruit, but the source is still here. And if the year is wet, it just gets worse than I'm sure you want. The I have with compost tea, herb tea, is that don't you have to aerate it? And, uh, I, and usually people use electrical electricity to get the thing going. I don't have that here. Nope. That is compost tea. An herbal tea is, is about fermenting. Mm -hmm. And the fermenting process just means sitting in the water for 7 to 10 to 14 days. And because I add effective microbes to that, they are facultative organisms that can both live in both an anaerobic environment and an aerobic environment. And so what I'm doing is does not involve electricity. You would like it, but you still have to get it out there on the tree by backpack sprayer or, or some means. I've got that um, motorized backpack sprayer. I don't think you could handle it. It's a like you want to do it. It's a mm -hmm. beast, but boy, you have to sit out there. Mm -hmm. I think you know, for the, those kind of sprays too, I'm sure it would work. You know? I mean, I, I'm, my, I'm confident because I put nematodes out and they live. 
that you can get it to work. I mean, it, you know, it drops it into the blower, and then you just got to no. make sure it decelerates. You know? Right. So you probably yeah. They give you total everything coverage. Everything quite you a could, bit. You could do this whole you? orchard in a couple hours. Perhaps. I mean, there's like netting or something. And then people would see you with this motor on your back. No, she's, I don't think, mine's too old. She couldn't handle it. You have to get her, her boyfriend to do it. You know, or hire, <laughs> hire a kid. That'd be even better yet. You know, hire a kid to do it, you know. Um, I have endurance, but not strength. It's, 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 I hate it, you know. It's, it's an old one, and it's got a gas motor and gasoline and three mm. gallons. I mean, that gets heavy. You know, I have to put it on something up above. If I try and lift it, I'm getting on. Yeah, tailgate of the truck to put it on. Yeah, tailgate of the truck to put it on, and then you got to put earmuffs on. It's, oh, yeah. But, boy, it covers it, you know. Did anybody talk about what's going on with that tree? Do you know what's going on with that we're one? We're looking at that tree now. Yeah. What is going on with that tree? In terms of form? In terms of where its leaves. Yeah, well, it's just, it does look like it's just like. <laughs> but she's wanted it with bowls. You can tell by checking around the hole around the trunk, right? Hey. Is Pat? Where's Pat? Is this the first year this tree looks so? It's had four. This year was the first year. I mean, it's been beautiful up until then. Is it a and what I, I Macintosh, or do you know? No, it was a tree, an old tree that was here. I transplanted a, a suck of, what do you call them, they sucker up in the ground. Um, transplanted it over here. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what it is, what it is but it's a wonderful apple. Did you poke around to see if there was bowl damage? And there's another one. Mm -hmm. There's another one over here that I that I also planted a couple of years later, which I planted too low, I think. So that's the same. Doesn't seem very soft. Variety. Okay. You chicken for bowls? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what it is. I mean, is I I don't think it's firelight. I don't think it's caterpillars. I mean, it. Could it be just not enough nutrition? I mean, this died back, but I don't see. It's like it might have had fire blight, but it kind of handled it in that portion. The top looks a lot more rugged, but I don't know why it has so limited vigor. Oh, here. Well, well maybe part of it. It's been pretty well. A oh lot right, of its oh right, right. base is gone. And, you know. uh -huh. and that could be rabbits, like if not voles. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's what's going on. I think. That's what's going on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's just been uh, deprived no of its no nutrition way. system. So the fact that it has any leaves is pretty impressive with as much yeah. bark as it's gone. Is there any way of bringing it back? To no. Okay. <laughs> I think it's also had a series of borers yeah. mm -hmm. because I see the holes and some brown frash. Mm -hmm. And so between whatever girdled it and borers, it's just been significantly weakened. Okay, I guess actually Janine Davis tells this story of the fact that one time at Bryn Mawr, the graduating seniors decided to do the future generations a favor and girdled an entire colonnade of, is it female ginkles that stink really bad? Yeah. They girdled all the trees, and all the trees lived, even though they're girdled. Cool. And they they did the research on why, and they said it was the mycorrhizae. Uh -huh. They said it was the incredible amount of mycorrhizae that somehow or another that those trees came back, even though they've been girdled. What did girdling mean? Like see, that I don't know. If, it, <laughs> if, if they did it all the way around, I don't see how it could possibly come back. But you can girdle it. If you didn't do it evenly, then maybe there'd be a, a window where something could live, and the mycorrhizae were incredible. But, but sometimes on... A 10, 20, 10, 12, 14 year old apple tree that hasn't borne fruit yet, it seems reluctant to bear, mm -hmm. to come in right around bloom time, right after bloom. And we call it scoring, but you're actually girdling the tree with a utility knife. Mm -hmm. And maybe two inches below that, you, you cut through the inner bark completely again. It's like grafting, and the tree has to callus it, but it shocks the upper part of the tree to thinking. I'm dying, I better get this reproduction business going. And then it gets 
kicks it into fruitfulness. So you're thinking that probably wasn't as severe? Like, so when someone know. says they've girdled, they could have done that kind of yeah. cut, and I could see how that would callus. But if they removed the bark for yeah. two feet, yeah. I don't know that yeah. okay. that's pretty miraculous. I just remembered that they said the reason it lived was the mycorrhizae. Maybe, so I was thinking maybe that would help. But yeah. So let's go under over here under a healthier tree and let's talk about some of the dynamics of what's going on around an apple tree. Would it not be good to do the girling you just said now? You had to do it right before bloom? If I actually had a tree I was going to do that with. The bloom timing relates to fruit cells form in the 30 to 40 days after petal fall. They've already formed, so to do it now is not going to have that impact on it forming fruit buds for next year. It's okay. too late. It's too late. That makes sense. This one. Could you grab me a, break off a stalk of comfrey and bring the comfrey to me? Okay, what I want to talk about now is how to manage the ground underneath your fruit trees. And one of the, the big things, the piece to understand here is that tree nutrition in terms of plant metabolism and, and the ability to produce certain phytochemicals that the tree uses to ward off disease, uh, one of the factors at play there is that when it's a fungally dominated soil ecosystem, and I'm talking now about the soil food web, you know, it's not bacterial dominated. That's what you just expect in a place where the soil is compacted, where you till the garden, where you disturb things. Um, but it's, it's an undisturbed place and there's lots of fungal foods added there. So fungal foods are the falling leaves, uh, the prunings of the tree left to, to break down underneath the tree. Um, they're tap-rooted plants that bring up minerals from the subsoil and fall over and decay. Um, they are wood chips from deciduous trees which are rich in all kinds of nutrients. The term we use for this is ramial wood chips. Um, they are chop and drop plantings of, of, of neighboring willow trees or even bamboo or red alder or Siberian pea shrub which fixes nitrogen. You don't have to run it through a chipper, it's just woodsy debris. And, and what we're doing here underneath the tree, ideally, is emulating the forest edge, just what decomposes. And it's lignin-rich material, cellulose-rich material. When a tree gets big and full, um, the ground is more shaded, you start to have less of that compact density of grass. You know, this, this is very much a mixed, mixed ecosystem of violets and all sorts of plants. Um, there are certain plants I like to grow on the periphery, and, and Pat has some comfrey growing in there in the interior of the tree. Um, comfrey is a plant that, a medicinal herb that contains allotonin. It's really good at healing sword uh, tears and strains. It's also good at knitting, literally knitting bones back together. Um, but this is a plant that grows to be about three feet tall and goes into flower right after the apple blooms and bumblebees love that so when we want to build up numbers of pollinators we have to think about something in bloom throughout the season again that's real easy here i mean you see the echinacea and you see the milkweed and all these good plants but comfrey's right in sync right after apple bloom before these other plants are in bloom so it's a good thing to have in the ecosystem but when comfrey grows gets top heavy after it flowers and falls down suppresses growth in that region a new flush of growth comes up. And this happens three times, usually in the growing season. 
and the next flush may fall this way, and the next flush may fall this way. But what that does is it starts to help keep the ground a little more open. But it's also providing this really rich in calcium plant matter, which really builds the soil. So I love to see tap-rooted plants of all sorts growing underneath the tree. And, and usually when I mean underneath, it isn't so much deep in the t interior, but more here on the outer ring of the tree, where it can get some sunlight and suppress the growth. Because inside, things are more suppressed just by virtue of, of the shading of the branches. This is the zone where we just want the mycorrhizal fungi and the saprophytic fungi to dominate. So the saprophytes are breaking down the organic matter, the mycorrhizae, you know, this tree with this diameter canopy, its permanent root system probably reaches out about to there, maybe a little bit further. And it goes probably fairly deep unless there's ledge or the water table's high, but I don't think you're dealing with high water table up here on the top of the mountain. Um, but from the perspective of the root reach, it has this area to draw phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and it may get depleted. So one of the organisms that we definitely want with our fruit trees are the mycorrhizal fungi. And these form a symbiotic relationship with the roots. And through their hyphae, they reach 100 times further. And they actually connect to other trees and to other plants. And that fungal hyphae will bring phosphorus from down below the garden up here to this tree, if that's what this tree needs. It'll bring copper or boron if that's what this tree needs. And it's the biology, when I talk about balanced nutrition, it isn't us doing an overloading of all these different nutrients. It's, it's really saying we're stewards of the biology. And as long as we don't screw it up and we favor that kind of fungal duff ecosystem that we would find on the edge of the forest, that's where our trees are most gonna thrive. That fungal duff ecosystem delivers nutrients to the trees in a partially built form. And it's that, those partially built carbohydrates and those amino acids, when a tree can get its nutrition that way, it has reserve energy, which allows it to produce more of the fats and essential oils and secondary plant metabolites, some of which are the immune function of the tree. So we've talked about the holistic sprays and the use of neem oils to stimulate that immune function. It's the biology in the soil that really drives it. So if we put the right biology in place, this is one of those natural advantages. That fungal dominated ecosystem, I don't know that you dipped way back your root systems in mycorrhizal fungi or ever actually apply to mycorrhizae, but you also have maple trees and tulip poplars, which have the same species that a fruit tree is gonna thrive on. And if, if for the first few years, your trees didn't have that, and I bet they did because you cleared this land and they were in the root systems of the ground here, they eventually reached here. And so I have a full expectation if you did a soil food web analysis, you'd find great numbers of fungi here. That's part of what's going on here, why these leaves are so green and robust. And, and it's a whole other way of thinking about fertility and nutrition. We, we usually think of, oh, uh, gotta have that NPK. That's, that's the conventional agriculture approach. We need the nitrogen to push growth. Uh, we need the phosphorus and potassium. And the more, the better, as long as it's not exceeding certain limits that it gets too expensive. But in the healthy orchard ecosystem, it's about the biology and it's about certain fertility ratios. Now, curious, do you do much soil testing? Have you ever done a soil test? Okay. And that's okay, it's not wrong. Um, it's through the soil test that I find, do I need more calcium and do I need more potassium in relationship to calcium? Do I need ma more magnesium? What's the pH in terms of the ideal? You're winging it, but it seems to be like you're winging it pretty good. <laughs> and again, I'm just looking at the growth. You know, one of the, another indicator for me is, is this year's shoot growth. So at this point, this shoot has grown about eight inches. And I expect this is where the, the growth began this year. I expect by the time the season ends, the shoot will be out here maybe 16, 18 inches long. So anywhere from 12 to 18 inches, that's an indication that fertility in terms of nitrogen is pretty good. 
Now, if that growth is really reduced, and you know, if we looked on a more shaded tree, we're not going to see as much growth. But this is in the sun. Um, that might tell me I need to up my compost application. I need to do a little bit more. And if that growth is really excessive, and especially in pears, um, that means there's a lot of nitrates involved, and the likelihood of getting fire blight is a lot higher. So you can, again, kind of wing it. You see good green growth, you see reasonable shoot growth, but as you start to fine tune it, there's a lot of value in a soil test, as long as you don't get fooled into thinking it's about the chemistry, because it's always about the biology. The biology is the important piece. Michael, for here, we're trying to bring in wood chips would be quite a job. Um, it is true from what I thought I understood yesterday that Pat could simply cut up her pruning and drop them down and that would accomplish what you're trying to do. Is that true? Yes. Actually, what do you do with pruning? You're, you're mostly summer pruning, so you're not taking that big of a branch off. Well, mostly. I've been using some for the hugo culture over there. Yeah. Um, and then some are down just in piles um, for making a dam at some point. Or I'd like to do some biochar. Um, lots of lots of ideas, but the f get, being able to get to it is very difficult, and um, so it's it's just down there decomposing. But it sounds like what Michael was saying yesterday is just drop it right under the tree would be a good thing. Yeah, I used to. Is that true? What about any diseases that might be on the limbs yeah. or? So, yeah, why well carry it down there? I mean, you have some purposes right. when you can drop it here. Yeah. So. A bigger limb with a fire blight canker, if I'm pruning in early spring, I might tune into that and pull it out. But it all changes when you go from leaving material in the air to dropping it to the soil line. So when you say hugo culture, I, I don't know if everyone knows what that means, but that's a permaculture term from Austria, Germany. And the idea is to bury woodsy debris. And by burying, that might mean you dig a hole, a trench, you put prunings, you put decaying logs from the forest, and you cover it with soil, you cover it with compost, you roll out an old mulch hay bale, uh, but you cover it. And now the biology that's going to decompose that material is different from up in the air. So black rot thrives in the air. That's why a dead branch in the air is a source of black rot inoculum. If you pile the prunings and let that pile be for years and years, it's not going to be broken down by the saprophytes down here. It's going to be broken down by rots, black rot being one of them. And black rot spores are going to come from that pile. And so that's not a good idea. Burying it is fine. But when you drop it to the soil, and if you took off a big branch and it was shaped like this, it would stick up in the air. But if you cut it, not so much small, but just enough so that it mostly lays flat, um, you don't have to bury it because this is an active biology down here. That's going to quickly consume that organic matter, the lignans in that wood, and it's perfect food for the fungi that you want to encourage. So, so, so not only not only prunings, but if if you were clearing brush on the edge of your field, um, those hardwood branches, small hardwood branches. When I use the term ramial wood chips, that's the source. But it doesn't have to be chipped. It just has to lay flat. So that becomes a great resource on almost any orchard site to help build the soil. And again, from my perspective in understanding the fungi and the biology, our human minds just have to wrap around the idea of what happens on the edge of the forest. Successive species fall over, a branch falls, leaves fall raspberries grow, goldenrod grows. All that kind of material is the perfect fungal food that's going to create the biology that fruit trees are going to thrive on. So you should, you should put, when, you, when you're layering that stuff, you should put a layer of hay over it even if it's... No, this is, when you drop it flat to the soil uh -huh. and it's not big huge wood, okay. it's going to be broken down fairly rapidly. Uh -huh. um, if you did a pile of raspberry canes, yeah, ideally you throw some compost on top of that. Just because if it doesn't break down quickly, that could become a viral vector. But in general, get it to the soil line and it's a whole nother dynamic. I noticed, in, I think, in your photographs that you had these piles, like 
like the pruning, like in, not all over under the tree, but s just sections. If I pruned this tree and I uh, opened it up a little bit more in terms of sunlight penetration and drying breeches, some of what I would take out of here would be a bigger branch. Now, if I chose a really big branch, I might chop up the butt end for cook stove wood just because it's good fuel. But the two and a half inches and smaller diameter stuff, if it's small enough for me to hand prune I drop those water sprouts and the type of prunings you're doing in the summer just to the ground. Whether that means two inch pieces or 12 inch pieces or two foot pieces, as long as they go mostly flat to the ground. But I also do have a chipper that I can run off the back of my tractor. So when I chip those little mini brush piles that I think you're referring to, I will shoot them basically into a pile. Not try to spread them really thin, but make it a four or six inch deep pile. Or if I bring in wood chips, from where they clear it under the power line or I cut my hardwood, my firewood and I, the tops of the trees and I chip that up. I, I use more piles because I want that to decompose for several years there. I don't want to put it as thin as I do the prunings. But that's just creating kind of a salad bar approach to nutrition and let the fungi and the feeder roots decide where they want to go. It also seems like it keeps, keeps everything so it's more accessible under the tree. More accessible. Well, end up tripping over stuff and it's just kind of in the way. Right. So I want to put the prunings under the drip line in towards the trunk. Mm -hmm. That's what I call the fungal duff zone. But you're also not going to trip over this if you did it right because you're cutting them into small enough pieces to lay flat. It's, it's not the same as leaving a branch light. You know, in, in the, it's actually a good thing they're doing, but in, in the commercial orchards, they throw the prunings into the aisle and then they come through with a big flail chopper. So it's good that they're returning the organic matter of the tree, and it's mostly small branches. But the convenience of using the flail chopper doesn't put the woodsy matter here under the tree. And out in the aisle where the tractor drives, it's more of a bacterial zone. And that's not bad, that's, that's part of the dynamic. But again, under the tree, fungal foods. Those fungal foods include the fatty acids in the sprays, and woodsy organic matter and, th and there's many ways to do it and it can be neat it can be wild but just understanding that even bringing those branches of what you prune just to clear back the forest that has a lot of value under the tree without processing it what do you recommend that i do with the, the brush piles down there cover them with something or there's several down there big Big How high? Uh, three feet you know, leaves fall and cover those piles and whether you have some extra dirt or compost to throw or hay to throw on top, mm -hmm. y you can create a new dynamic. Hay is probably the easiest way to, to go about that. But you were going to build a dam. Yeah, <laughs> What are some other plants you would put in the, this zone? I mean, I, I think, I think Whether we grow here at the canopy edge or out here in the aisle, like here's echinacea, or down below there was milkweed, you know, all that's part of the ecosystem in terms of the beneficials. It's tap-rooted plants, comfrey, this plant has a taproot that goes six to eight feet deep and that pulls up subsoil minerals and that so enriches the soil up here at the top at the humus layer. Um, chicory could be here, dandelion could be here. Um, some people plant a lot of woodsy herbs like rosemary and thyme and lavender, then going for more of a neat look in that respect. Um, there's a plant called sweet sicily. Does anyone know sweet sicily? Okay, I have some trees in our yard that are just totally sweet Sicily. That's not very diverse, but they just grow in there if you don't mow it. And after it goes to seed, and, and what I love about sweet Sicily is those seed pods. It, it's like 
the original good and plenty candy. I mean, it's just licorice and it's tender. Um, but sweet Sicily is one of those flowers that attracts all kinds of beneficial insects. And there is a point where I sigh it down and let a new flush of growth come and a new round of flowering. And that's the main reason I'm, I'm doing that in that case. But there's many different plants that can grow here and look. But mostly it's about the whole surrounds and the more diversity you have there, the better. Do you use mints and other things that have... I have some mints and chives. There's nettles under some trees. There's trollis under another tree. Um, the plants somewhat decide that. The only plant that I deliberately put out there is comfrey. And my typical comfrey approach is when this tree would have been five or six, I would have done four or five spots around about six, eight feet out, knowing that six to eight feet out would mean it's about here. And I'd let it flower, it's going to fall over. If it gets stuck in the branches, I probably would sigh it just so I have airflow up here. And a new growth comes, and some falls this way. It's a great plant on this border edge because this is where the plants get enough sunlight and it can get a lot thicker and denser. And you're mowing, um, and so it looks pretty tame as these things go. But without that mowing, this could be really high. You know, my whole mowing thing um, is in the week or two after petal fall, I come in with a sigh and, and I will pull the material out to the drip line and then I'll cut this zone out here, just the swath of the sigh, I don't go further than that, and pull it in. And it's at that point in the tree cycle, right after petal fall, that the root system has the spring feeder root flush. And those feeder roots only go an inch or two, and the mycorrhizae expand at that time with it. At that point, the tree is gathering nutrients to grow fruit this year's crop, and also nutrients to form next year's flower cells. So when I let things grow early in the spring, that helps suppress those leaves where spores are going to come from. That's a good thing. When I go and sigh it and make a mulch, those plants, a lot of them, are just at the point where they're going to set seed. So they go from a high nitrogen state, green lushness, to a more carbon state. And at the point when you cut hay traditionally, which again is right at petal fall, a week or two after, um, the forage is optimal for the purposes of livestock, but it's also optimal for the purposes of fungi. So I, I end up shocking these plants that are growing here so their root systems retract just as feeder roots are going for the nutrients. And because there's a mulch suppression factor, it's just perfect for those spring feeder roots. So an another thing, I mean, here you've been mowing more regularly. When I cleared ground, cleared a pasture, I did stump and till cover crop where the trees were going to go. But out here, I just cut root systems of the ground so trees had stump sprouts. And that's part of when I sigh that in. That's like a chop and drop plant. And it's like a perfect source of soluble lignans, which the fungi really thrive on. So again, it's just understanding what's the tree roots doing, when are nutrients being taken up, what are fungal foods, and it doesn't have to be complicated. Just take your mind to the forest edge. What happens there is what wants to happen here. Um, if you do some clearing and want to put in a, an orchard, um, and you do take off the stumps and don't do what you just did, leave the stumps there, does it actually disturb the mycorrhizae pretty severely? So it would take it, a long time doing what you talked about to rekindle the uh, population of mycorrhizae? No, that, that level of disturbance where you're pulling every stump and possibly there's a bulldozer, that's, that's big time disturbance. And so, yeah, the, the biology is basically wiped out in that move. But, and it depends on the situation and what your goals are with the land and the rock factor, what kind of grasses grow there, ideally cover cropping. When you plant fruit trees and you either dip that root system in a mycorrhizal gel or you put some mycorrhizal powder, which bioorganics and mycorrhizal applications sell a mixture of 10 to 12 species. Um, two or three are going to be perfect. You've re reintroduced the inoculum where there are roots. So mycorrhizae can't be there unless there are roots. But now, as you start to work with your fruit trees, 
and grow that bigger and bigger canopy and feed fungal foods, you restore that biology. So there are legitimate reasons in planting an orchard to cover crop, to clear the land, that disturbance is necessary. And that biological compromise gets us to a place where we can rebuild it. So that, that's okay, but you have to understand how to rebuild it and get it back in place. Well, my source of leaves are these, <laughs> what falls here. I don't do much in terms of bringing leaves from other tree species here. On the other hand, you know, one of the great resources, because most of the people out there aren't so smart about these things, are those bags of leaves <laughs> that they put at the curve. And so I take a lot of them to compost and to mulch in my gardens, and some of that through the compost gets back here. But I, I haven't taken to dumping those leaves out here as well. But you could. I mean, if you have a really poor soil and not much organic matter, that's one of those sources that's worth putting out around your fruit trees. In the first couple of years establishing an orchard, did we want to eliminate grasses with, you know, cover crops that outcompete grasses? Do we not want the grasses because of them? You're saying the roots would go too deep below the humus level. And so they won't take advantage. So in the first the few years, my goal is to keep three to even four feet around that young tree clear of a lot of growth. And not just grasses, but just a lot of other plants in general. And that may mean more heavier mulching, that may mean shallow cultivating, but to give that tree four or five years of, I get the nutrients, I get the water, I'm growing wood structure. Now, once it gets a little bit bigger, some things growing in there, particularly tap-rooted plants, that's fine. It's, it's not an issue. Um, nor am I ever going to try to completely mulch a big tree. The thing about grasses is, how often do you mow here, Pat? I mean, you have to mow every few weeks probably because otherwise your machine probably can't handle it. Probably a month, once a month. You can go a month. Where you mow regularly, and here I'm talking more about the suburban lawn, you create, I mean this, even though it's been mowed once a month, there's still clovers and, and things growing here because it's, it's not being knocked back constantly. But when you mow regularly, the other species don't tend to be in that sod, and the grass gets denser. And when you compare the root density of a mixed plant meadow ecosystem, to that of a mown lawn, the root density is, is 20 times higher under the mown lawn. That's just the nature of grass. It doesn't go as deep, it's just dense. And the mown lawn, those grasses, all plants respire carbon dioxide. So under a mown lawn, if, if you're growing your fruit trees in the lawn, um, your tree is green, but its feeder roots dive down deeper because the carbon dioxide levels are too high right under the sod. And that means it only gets its nutrition as soluble ions. It doesn't get it partially built. And that means it doesn't produce as many phytochemicals to resist disease. That means it needs more medicine because of scab and rot issues. And so the subtler methods don't work as well because we're not keeping, giving the tree all it can be. But when it's in this type of ecosystem, which looks just as green as a mown lawn, the root density is not as thick. And that management of, of sighing right after petal fall to facilitate the feeder roots getting into the humus. And then in the fall, I do a complete mowing where I chop things up. That's about reducing cover for voles, but also chopping up these fallen leaves. And I want that organic matter, but I want to chop it up so there's less of it to survive the next spring to be the source of disease. As you begin to understand how all these pieces weave together, it, it's, it justifies why you no longer golf and you no longer go skiing and why you no longer mm -hmm. play polo and, and whatever. <laughs> and you give up your TV. I mean, it's, it's this freeing. Are any of those leaves prone to having scab left on them? In so, the fall, in the fall, in an the interesting thing about your leaves, even though, and I don't know if this is one of those scab-free varieties, even though I see some significant scab on some of those apples, on the leaves, 
this is a spy. Okay. On the leaves, I'm not seeing much for scab spotting, which is interesting. I, I, I'm not sure what that's about. But by fall, there's probably some scab in this tree. And by fall, those rains during harvest, and you're no longer thinking about scab as an issue, leaves might get even scabbier. And when they fall, during the warmth of October, scab forms spore sacs. Mm -hmm. And that leaf is vertical, but <laughs> let's lay it flat. And those spore sacs are formed pointing up. And so if that leaf does not get eaten by an earthworm, doesn't get chopped through mowing so that other microorganisms are likely to eat it, doesn't get a coat of lime, which hinders the, the ability of the fungus to set up that spore sac, that's more likely to be here. And the more of those leaves that are left, you know, and so in, I'm going to go to a chemical orchard now, um, where it's an herbicide strip and things, there's no biology, leaves often lay there and don't get consumed because they don't have that dynamic in place. And that's not an issue in a chemical orchard because they have these heavy hitting fungicides. Of course, those fungicides drip to the ground and further kill off the mycorrhizae and the saprophytic fungi. But again, it's not an issue because they have a medicine to compensate for that nutritional biological deficiency. As organic growers, we don't have those types of medicines. I mean, you can come in here and spray sulfur 30 times and you'd have less scab, but that also will impact the soil biology. So the holistic approach is all about meeting those nutritional and biological deficiencies and making things right through understanding deeper and that in turn makes our ability to work with nature's way to resist disease we enhance that and and again the degree that works for you do you want to spray do you want to do the silica and calcium teas um, if the amount of rot that loss of the crop it still works for you to make a living with the crop that doesn't get the disease well that's beautiful and it depends on your investment and, and, and your desires. Some years, wetter years, it's going to be far more overwhelming. You know, and so not everything's going to always be successful. And, and you can get tuned into, well, maybe I do need two sprays of sulfur. Not 20, two sprays. And you tie that into understanding wetting events. Is it staying wet long enough? Has there just been 10, 14 days of sunshine? And that means spores have matured and they haven't been released. And now this rain comes and there's going to be 50% of the spores for the year released at that moment. Well, that's maybe a time that you go that route if that's the kind of variety you're growing that's real susceptible. Um, on the other hand, I think the holistic method as we get a little deeper into understanding it collectively, and that means regionally in different places, is going to even outpace those one or two sprays of sulfur. Now, fire, fire blight's an extreme other example. Um, but again, it's all about the nuance. And here it's bacteria diseases require an opportunity. An opportunity comes in the form of an open flower. And if we come through with compost tea or, or yeast spray or an effective microbe spray and colonize that flower before the bacteria of the disease gets in there, the disease doesn't happen. It's, it's actually so exciting how this is coming together as we start to understand the pieces. Mm -hmm. But cool. what you're doing here is all about using as many of the natural advantages as you can and it's working for you. I mean maybe you would wish you didn't have that gala and you instead had a more resistant mm -hmm. honey crisp or sweet 16 and maybe you do have those varieties. Um, they're not totally resistant but that that ties into the design but just like you, when I first planted trees, I didn't know anything. I was a whip. And over the years, I've got a pretty good branch structure. Mm -hmm. And we all get that. We all learn what we need to learn if we stick with it. And that's actually what I've observed is one of the qualities of a fruit grower is tenacity. That ability to stick with it despite challenge after challenge after challenge. Maybe that means we're really dumb. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that stubbornness, that tenacity to understand and come back the next year and believe it's possible again 
it's we're going to get this right i think is the real mark of of succeeding at orcharding okay michael we are at about 10 minutes to six five minutes to six if people are into it and you're into it do it as long as you want but you know, no i've passed your contracted time <laughs> we could take all of our questions and our tummies down to the barn <laughs> where there's food Let's do it. and Can continue we go to the, the top? conversation there. Yeah, just an idea. The the just blueberries? I'll just go up. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's a good moment to end and we'll people can continue to dialogue. But thank you all for coming way up here in the height of the mountain. Thank you, Pat, for having us. It, it is a thrill to be here. So thank you. I was trying to give you that. I know, and you did. Sea you got made oh, spring. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Let's go up this way. Did you plant all these echinacea from seed? Or? Uh, just a little bit, yeah, from seed that we got along the side of the road, and then um, they spread by the, with the birds. <laughs> yeah. There's a... And a little patch of oregano we brought down from Vermont. That has just spread to, you see the pear tree? Oh yeah, pear. Like Asian pear? No, it's just a regular Bartlett. I have a seckle pear uh, down there. Seckle Gold, pear? Seckle, the seckle. golden, the seckle, the golden honey pear. It's to your right, Taylor, the, se the seckle. See that, that golden, the pear, straight ahead. There's poison ivy up here too. Uh, you might not want to come. It's this tree right here with a little, they're kind of purplish magenta, small pears. Anyway, like a, are you, were you pointing at this? Because these are apples. Straight ahead. Right that, there. this. That, yeah. that is an amazing pear. Red. Is it called a seckle? Seckle, uh huh. You have a hard, like a more of a tough out, outside when, you're eat, when you've eaten it, or is it, I mean, when you're eating no, it? No, no, it'll be, it, it'll ripen soft in August. Soft on the outside? Yeah, it's soft and it is like, ah. Oh, Food of the gods. It is so sweet. Mm. It's honey. It's just an it's amazing thing to dry and seckle. Seckle. S E C K E L. Seckle. In August. That's my birthday. All right. We'll have to like, come back out. Yeah, it's not far. Now that looks like. See that dead branch? I don't know if that's. I hope it's not fire blight. I don't think it is. Probably some kind of deer. Damage, maybe. Where did you get that pair? The seckle, um, probably from one of those initial, um, you know, when we get all the uh, apples, Millers or um, Stark Brothers. Millers, but or what? Stark Stark Brothers. Stark Brothers. I mean, any of the major. Okay. But I would go to a a more local nursery, a more Organic one, you know, not so commercial. Uh huh. So I don't know if everyone wants to come this way, but are you planting more here, Pat? This was supposed to be um, amaranth, okay. but it never the seed never took. Potatoes, some potatoes over there that were planted this year just to kind of take back some of the grass. And here are the blueberries. That is the uh, echinacea. Uh, is, that, is that self spreading? I mean, yes. It moves around yes. A bit. Yeah. yeah. Birds and uh, I'd say birds mainly.
Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Help yourself. What variety did you grow? Well, um, there's about five different varieties. This is a Colville that comes in August, end of July and August. They're not quite ripe. And then you've got some down here. Um, most of these have already been harvested. Um, oh, this row here is, is the Patriot. Patriot. They are ripe right now. Need to be picked. We're gonna we're gonna sample some when we get down for supper. We'll try some of these over here. Uh huh. Of course, the birds are enjoying them too. Yeah, we have about 15. Do you? Yes. I mean, yes. and they're really robust. And we That's put nice. netting over them, and uh, we've got this little blueberry world that when we go up, it's like a tent. We just yes. go in there and pick. Oh, you nice, know? nice. They, are they are they this big? I mean, these are so old and. You know, yeah, they're, they're big. They're at least this big. We have to top them, actually. You know, because yeah, I need tall. to. I, I hardly ever get time to prune them. What um, size netting are you using to keep birds up? Well, we had this. Um, I don't know what size. It was like an inch or greater. But we noticed that it would catch the uh, bushes. Hmm. You know, the, the, the webbing and uh, get caught on it and you, like when you moved it around it would pull berries off and I love your I love your expression it's so there it's so <laughs> alive it's, it's great real. It's, it's called what it's real real yes it's, it's, it's refreshing isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> it's called free. here we go that works just fine. And it she always it calls me when I'm getting my last shot. Almost pull it over the bushes. So you put it over the bush and then just you know, and There's a, it if it were clear, you could see Mount Mitchell yeah. from oh, really? yeah. clouds are in the way. And then uh, we, make a, we have a door in the hills if you go to the close wind. Okay. You just go in and out through there. Okay. Love the butterfly. And this is where the bears come in. Oh. Uh huh. I saw one here in the orchard. Yeah, well, in the apple tree, actually. Oh, you know what you need here? A barrier. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> they do. They do. They they spend a lot of time growling and barking. In fact, one of my dogs looks a lot like your black dog. Oh, neat. Yeah. Aren't they wonderful? Mm -hmm. and she hurts my chickens. She hurts. She's a herding dog. Okay. Because she like hurts my chickens. Yeah. yeah. Border collie. Yeah. We live out we live out pretty far. We yeah, live, uh, oh, Spring Mowing Creek is such a beautiful It is, yeah. And we have uh, lots of water on the yeah. property.